Just want to give honor to a few that have traveled far away. Brother Delfino, all the way from Texas. Give him a big hand. Brother Del, Billy Delgado, all the way from Miami, Florida. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I know there's a brother from Sweden. I don't know where he is, but uh, I guess he's on his way. Uh, he's not here. He's probably with Andy. He's probably, he was probably living with Andy. Okay, so Andy's really late. Got to work on that. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. Me well, too. I just arrived from Montreal. Montreal. Oh, yes. Montreal. And we got another special guest all the way from Louisiana, um, a man of God uh, many years ago, maybe about three or four years ago, something like that. Uh, there was a man that showed up uh, on, the, on the block, just came out of nowhere. Someone called me. I think I was in UK. I said, somebody's preaching. But he's actually not bad. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I think his name is Philip. I'm like, is it, is it this Philip? Like, no, no, not that Philip. This is this guy's actually a solid guy. And, and we connected with him. I was like, okay, well, you know what? Uh, that's awesome. And, you know, just, just work with him. And, and, you know, that's great. And then I ended up bumping into this guy in London, UK. Wow. And wow. Um, I got to just hear his heart a bit and, and see his character. and. And I mean, you, you don't know everybody right off the bat, but but I could just sense that the Lord um, has worked in this man's life and is in this man's life, and I I just had a respect for him. Um, you know, sometimes you just meet some people and you're like, okay, that that's a solid dude. You, you ever been there before? Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. And so you know, you know, here and there, you know, we connect with each other on Facebook. I I, I got to learn a little about his ministry and. <laughs> And uh, I was just impressed. I mean, this man travels to like places like Pakistan, places like Honduras. I mean, I, I heard about Honduras, how it has, I believe it's the murder capital of the world. I, I, El Salvador, going into jails with the worst of the worst in the world. Uh, Africa, South America, Central America, places in Europe. I mean, this guy, is all over the world, literally. I mean, if we're, if if you want to know or meet somebody that's a modern day missionary, apostolic evangelist, man of God that casts out demons, prays for the sick, um, you're in the right place uh, because we have someone like that today. I mean, this is like. You know, going back a hundred years and you would hear about missionaries going into Africa and, and, you know, but this man doesn't just go to Africa. He goes all the way. So we have someone, I, I don't want to compare because they did their great worth. They did their great works then. But we have someone that is even doing greater works. You know, even Jesus said Amen. greater works than yeah. these shall you do, even though he was the greatest. Yeah. But someone carried on that work. And I believe that we have to give honor to those who set a platform for this generation to go there and, and, to, and to minister. And so we honor those who were pioneers in Africa and all those other places so that men uh, and women of God in this generation can go. But we know someone, and we have someone here that is going, has gone, and is continuing to go. And every time he comes here, uh, it's almost like... Uh, a, a tag team effect on the devil, and 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 and, and, and all hell breaks Amen. loose. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. He reminded me just a moment ago. He said, "You know, why does it seem like every time I hang out with you, brother Dave, the police get involved, and demons start coming out?" And... <laughs> well, without further ado, and I would like all of us to honor. The Bible says, "Give honor to where honor is due." I'd like us all to stand and uh, let's welcome a bit with a big, I know many of us from different places, but with a big Christian brotherly welcome, Brother Philip Andrew Blair. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. I love you. Love you too. That's my. Good morning. Good morning. Let's open in prayer. 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, we lift you up. We give you glory. We thank you for bringing us together. You are such a good Father. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, God, for the breath in our lungs. Thank you, God, that we can share your life and that the world can see your life through us. God, I pray that today you would speak through me. I pray that everyone here would see your face, hear your voice, feel your touch, and experience your love and know that you have been with us during this time. God, I pray that you would help us to, to step aside, to become empty of self so that you might pour into us, God. And that you might send us out so that we might be poured out onto the world. That we might be that city on a hill. So that those who are wandering in darkness that are lost, that they can't see their way or can't find the path through life. That they might see the light that we're shining and find you. Lord, that we might preach with the fire of God. That that consuming fire would just burn up every enemy work, every cage, every chain that so easily besets us, God, that so easily keeps those who are lost in the chains that they're in, God, that they would just be burned up, that you would bring freedom to the captives and the opening of the prison of those who are bound. Lord, start here today something wonderful in Toronto and let it spread like a fire throughout all of Canada. We love you so much. We thank you, God. Speak through me. I need you, God. Forgive us for our sins. We bind in the name of Jesus Christ every demonic spirit in this room that would, that would try to hinder us, that would try to distract us. Any evil spirits working on or in anyone, any, any demons that are rooted in anyone here, we bind you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We command you to leave. We take authority over you as servants of the Most High God. We declare this place a a holy place, a temple of God, where we might glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have no legal right to be here. Go right now Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, please have a seat. My name is Philip Blair. I'm the director and founder of Torch of Christ Ministries. I'm going to give you a quick intro, but the first thing that I want you to know about me this morning is that I am a very intense person. I'm very intense, and that's just how God made me, uh, I think, to, to really uh, be able to go into some of these places that God has called me to. Uh, even with the intensity, uh, I feel the love of God so strongly through me for, for all people. And uh, you'll, you'll hopefully see that today as well, but I, I want you to understand that if I seem serious, if I don't smile a lot, it's because we're living in a time, I don't know if I even need, do I need this? I, I, it's good. We're living in a time where the situation is serious. The darkness, it doesn't rest. The enemy's not taking a day off. We see Satanists out there praying without ceasing to their Lord to take over our governments, to take over our schools, to take over our communities. Evil is real. Darkness is real. And if they're not resting, neither can we. God gives us joy. He gives us peace. But we have to be steadfast. We have to be firm in what we know and what we believe in. And so that's why you'll see me. Uh, I'm going to be pretty serious today because it's a serious subject. But hopefully... Uh, my goal is when you leave today, your life is going to be changed in some way that you're going to be impacted. I want what you hear today to impact you for the rest of your life. Only God can do that through me, but that is me walking in faith, believing that he'll say something through me today that you'll remember forever. All right. Uh, I was in the military and I've heard a lot of people speak over the years. But one thing that they said that always stuck with me is that you're not going to remember everything I say, but you're going to remember the way I made you feel. Okay, and I hope that you leave here today feeling the love of God, the joy of the Lord, and, and, and knowing that the peace of God is with you and leading you, okay? You are not alone. We're in this together. And uh, I have a lot of information I want to cover with you. Uh, I, I'm planning on, it's going to be a solid two hours of talking, uh, but I want your feedback. I want discussion. I'm going to ask you questions. It's not a right or wrong answer. I want to know what you think. I want to know how you feel. And I'm going to add my own thoughts to it as well. Um, 
so let's start out with just a little bit about me. I'm 33 years old. Uh, I, I grew up in, uh, my whole family's from Mississippi. I grew up in Texas. I come from a broken home. My dad is, was a pastor, all right? My parents divorced when I was five. He made a lot of mistakes, a lot of brokenness when I was little. I grew up wanting to grow up. As a kid, I was just so ready to be able to become an adult, to make my own life, to be able to make uh, a name for myself if you want to call it that, because I, was, I had worldly ideology, worldly mindset at the time. I wanted to grow up so I could get rich, be fit, whatever it was, these dreams you have in your heart when you're 16 years old or whatever. So at 17, I joined the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I was gone for five years. I lived in Hawaii for four. I worked uh, for the NSA underneath a pineapple field, uh, doing really cool stuff that I can't talk about. Uh, I got out of the Marine Corps. I moved to Arizona for six years. I worked for the Department of Defense, uh, teaching electronic warfare. So I have about 10 years of public speaking experience. Um, I did that for uh, the, the actual teaching electronic warfare I did for four and a half. Um, at that point, I moved to Louisiana. I worked offshore for Shell as a safety officer for about two and a half years. And then I went into full-time ministry. June of this year, will be three years of full-time ministry. I was doing part-time ministry before, but three years I've been running and gunning full-time. This is my life day in and day out. I wanna serve the Lord. But I remember that period of time before I went into full-time ministry where I prayed. You know, the Bible says, sow in tears so that you might reap in joy, right? That if we sow in tears, we're gonna reap in joy. It's a promise that God gives us. And I put in my sowing in tears, walking around that oil rig, crying out to God, saying, God, I hate this. I want to serve you. I need ministry. You've called me to it. I need this in my life. Some of you feel that way today. Some of you are saying, I want to serve you. How do I do it? Where do I start? How do I overcome the fear? Where are the resources going to come from? I don't even know how to pay my rent month to month. How am I supposed to go out there and feed the poor? These are questions that we have but God provides an answer. And hopefully I have time to give you some testimony. I could testify for days, but I've tried to pick out some things that I think will impact you. And we'll kind of talk about some of that, okay? My life has not been an easy life. I come from a broken past. I grew up poor, all right? I remember as a kid shooting rat, literally, I'm not saying this to be funny or cool, living in a trailer park, we would eat dinner, We'd be in the living room an hour later, there'd be rats on the stove eating the food and we'd shoot them with a BB gun. I'm a kid, we were crazy and we lived in the country, but we would take the little, you know, the little one pump daisy BB gun. We'd shoot rats off the stove, man, or we tried to. You know, a little daisy BB gun ain't got no accuracy to it, but we tried. I mean, that's the kind of poverty I grew up in. Uh, God can take you from any past. It doesn't matter where we came from, doesn't matter where we grew up, doesn't matter what country we're from. We're all brothers and sisters in the faith and God wants to do something in your life. There is nothing special about me to to myself. And that's the mark of true humility. It's not a false humility. The Bible says, actually the dictionary says, humility is having a low opinion of oneself. The only good in me is God. When I was on that oil rig and I was praying for God to bring me into full-time ministry, I was so thankful that he had brought me out of darkness, brought me out of sin. I was saved dramatically at 15, but I ran from God for a long time. When I came back, I was so thankful. I said, God, help me to live for you. I'm just so thankful for everything you've done for me. Help me to live for you. Help me to show the world how thankful or, or how gracious or grateful I am for all that you've done for me. Help me to serve you and to do all these things. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly. You know what he said? He, this will change your life catch it. He said, Philip, stop trying to live for me and die to yourself so I can live through you. That changed my life because oftentimes we try to live for God. We say, oh, if I, if I do enough things for God, then maybe he'll love me. Or if I, if I serve him hard enough, maybe he'll give me favor. You're not going to find favor with God through works. That's the first thing we need to understand. Pastor David Lynn gave me an incredible uh, intro. All right. Best I've ever gotten. That was amazing, brother. Thank you. But the greatest works of righteousness in our own strength are filthy rags, right? None of that matters unless it stems from God. So I want you to understand, we're not defined by our works. We work because we love Him. We're not trying to get favor from God through our works. We're only serving Him because we want the world to experience the same love of God that we experience day in and day out. How we're able 
to overcome difficulty, how we're able to keep our joy and our peace daily because we know that God is with us. You see, fear, some of you I know today, if I were to ask you individually, you're facing fear, worry, anxiety, despair, discouragement, heaviness. These are all spirits that attack you, right? If I were to talk to you, some of you are in chains today, right? The truth is, if you trust in God fully, there's no room for fear. You can't fear and trust at the same time. You can't have anxiety and trust God at the same time. So we have to understand that it all begins in trust. If God sends me to Pakistan, I can't walk through Pakistan in fear. Because that opening is going to be what the enemy uses to attack me. And I'm not going to be effective. People aren't going to receive what God has for them. And we are going to be limited in what God can do through us. Do you understand? Amen. Amen. Where's my water at? I have it somewhere. I have one open already. Right here. Oh, it's invisible. I'm just going to set it here. Good morning, gentlemen. All right, so everything I just said, none of it's in my notes. <laughs> God has a way of just speaking, right? So amazing. Let's talk about global missions. I believe that missionary work is the heart of evangelism. Or evangelism is the heart of missionary work. It, it really goes both ways. Not all of us are called to missionary work, but I, I believe that everyone should at least go on one mission in their life. Okay, And I believe that each and every one of us are here because we have been called of God to serve Him in some way or you wouldn't be here. You're here because you've been drawn by the Lord. And so I encourage you to one day try to be a part of a mission. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there through Torch of Christ Ministries and other missionary organizations. Even if it's you forming your own team to go to places like Mexico or Cuba, I heard it's really easy for you guys to get into Cuba as a Canadian. Going to Cuba as a form a team, three people, that's all you need. And you can impact a whole population, a whole community, and see the glory of God fall. We're going to talk about what it means. We're going to talk about how uh, some of the ins and outs of global missions, what you uh, might want to consider while you're preparing, while you're in country. We're going to talk about a whole, uh, a whole list of things, and I hope that you really are, uh, are going to, your heart is prepared to receive from God. Okay. The main purpose of global missions, I believe, starts with evangelism. Can anybody here expound on that? What do you think is the main purpose? You go on a mission into another country, whether it's a friendly country like the United Kingdom or whether it's more hostile country like Indonesia, Pakistan. What is your main objective? Can anybody tell me? Preach the gospel and win souls, right? It is not to go and just build houses and churches to waste money or to go on vacation. That's the first thing I'm going to say. I see so many churches out there, and I'm not trying to hate on anybody or knock any uh, organizations out there, but we're wasting too much money in the body of Christ for our teens and our youth to go on vacation to Norway and to waste time or to go somewhere and build a church for two weeks or, or excuse me, not build a church, but build houses and nobody gets saved. Building houses are good. Building churches are good. But if no one gets saved, what are we really doing? So it starts with evangelism. The heart of global missions is evangelism. To reach the lost with the gospel of Christ by any means necessary. And I mean, whether it's you standing on a train preaching, whether it's you in a church, an alleyway on top of a pyramid. I've done that. Uh, wherever you are, to preach the gospel, to talk to somebody. You can't outwardly preach everywhere you go because some places are just going to get jailed immediately or killed. But you can talk to somebody. There are many ways that you can have a conversation. All right, we're going to talk about a lot of these things. The heart of all missionary work is evangelism. The only reason any of it matters is so that we might reach the lost by any means necessary. I just said that. Who here is interested in global missions? Okay, and it doesn't have to be everybody. Not everybody's, okay, good, good. So about, I would say two-thirds of you, three-quarters of you. Not everyone here is going to go on a mission trip in their lifetime. That's okay. You're called to other things. We should never get outside of God's will for our life. That's the truth. That's the first thing I could tell you is, if God hasn't called you to it, don't do it. 
You want to be in the will of God all the time. The only way you know that God is with you is if you're doing exactly what he's asking you to do. How many times in my life I've been on a train in St. Louis or I've been on, on a lake at 1130 at night uh, in Sweden or I've been at the top of a hill in Athens, Greece, praying to God, knowing that at that moment I'm exactly where God wants me to be. There's a peace and a joy knowing that he's with you so that if anything happens, you know that it's his will. If you're outside of God's will, you get arrested, you get persecuted. Is it because you're where you're supposed to be or is it because you're out of place? We don't know. If I know I'm exactly where God wants me and something bad happens, I know that he's behind it and I can have faith through it, right? And there's joy in that. That's why we're able to be behind bars or in handcuffs and still sing praises unto God because we know that God is leading the way that His Spirit's gone before us. Amen. So the first thing I could tell you today is know what your calling is. If you don't pray, sometimes you pray and I'll pray something and I'll say, God, you know, what is the sign of a true Christian? What is the sign that somebody's really gotten saved? And I remember he immediately answered. He said, the Spirit of God will bear fruit unto righteousness in their life. Immediately answered me. There's been other things I had to pray for weeks or months before I got an answer. So some of you might pray and you might know instantly what your calling is. When I was saved at 15, I knew instantly I was called to evangelism. I'm not called to be a pastor, right? I'm to bring in the lost, to help them find Jesus so brothers like Pastor David can shepherd them, can, can disciple. You know what I'm saying? We're all called to make disciples, but we're not all called to be a shepherd. Do you understand? The fivefold gospel or ministry is there for a reason. So we have to be in our niche. We have to know where God wants us and to stay in that area and to not move out of that area until he calls us to. Right? Okay. Is anyone here called to missionary work? Not interested, but who here feels like God is saying, I want you to be a missionary? Amen. Praise God. Five or six of you. Praise God. All right. Sister, share with me uh, just 10 seconds, 15 seconds of what you feel like God is pressing on your heart. Uh, well, I'm from Nunavik, Nunavik and uh, I'm Inuit. I speak my native language. We have the highest suicide rate in the world, and I'm definitely called to go up there to my people. Praise God. Praise God. Who else? Did you raise your hand, brother? So, yeah, Andy, go ahead. Amen. Have you been there before? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother level, right? <laughs> Praise God. Missionary work is not easy. It takes patience. It takes uh, a forgiving heart, especially places like Israel. You would never guess, but uh, the, the Jews are very hostile towards the gospel. They're one of the most hostile people, hostile people groups in the world against Christianity because they see it as a direct threat against their faith. And um, it's unfortunate, but if we're not going there, we're not preaching, who is going to? I have friends in the Messianic Christian community in Israel, and uh, a lot of them are against tree preaching. A lot of them are against some of the forms of evangelism that we do. But the truth is, and I tell them this in love, is that they have to be about the Father's business in a more direct way. A lot of them are not, uh, they're, they're living out their faith in fear, pretty much, because persecution in Israel is very real. And I understand, it's easy for us to go into a place, to preach and leave, they have to live there, we'll talk about that. But um, we have to know that God is with us. Even if we're in the area, we're living in the area, persecution's real. People like Hudson Taylor going into China. Who's heard of Hudson Taylor before? All right, not enough of you, apparently, or three or four. Read about Hudson Taylor, one of the most amazing missionaries I've ever read about. The book about his life, I think it's called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. Written about it, it was written by his children. That book single-handedly changed my life. Read about uh, people like George Mueller. George Mueller was sowing financially into Hudson Taylor's work. Hudson Taylor was a, a trailblazer into China. 
And the boom that we see in Christianity in China today, even in the persecuted church, is directly because of the seeds that Hudson Taylor sowed in the early to mid-1800s. Amazing work, right? Uh, but he saw persecution. He saw, I mean, in the midst of them being slaughtered, he lost kids. He lost his children. He lost, uh, not through persecution, but through disease. His wife died. Um, just crazy, incredible things happen during his life. You're going to see that persecution come against you. But if you know God is with you, you're going to get through it. Right? So read about people like Hudson Taylor, and it will prepare you for the work that God has for your life, for those who are called to missionary work. Persecution is going to happen. Effective missionary work comes at a high cost. I want to share some stories with you of things that I've seen uh, out on the, the roads, the streets, in the villages. We've gone to places like the Philippines where uh, I was in the middle of a service. And uh, at this point, I'm oblivious. I mean, I'm in the zone. I'm praying for people for healing and deliverance. One of the guys comes up. He's in shorts. He's got no other clothes on. I lay hands on him. I pray. He's got his hands behind his back. And he was kind of manifesting like there was a, a demonic spirit in his life. But, I, you know, as a minister, sometimes when you pray for people, you know if a demon's going to leave. And sometimes you know that... Uh, he, he's got to do some things. He's got to give his heart to God or he's got to break some legal rights before that spirit is going to depart. And uh, I saw some manifestations, but not enough to really know that it was going to leave. And, and we're pressed for time because we're praying for a whole uh, crowd of people. So I prayed for him, but then he went on his way. About 30 seconds later, I'm praying for somebody else and a fight breaks out to my left. And I look over there and I see these two guys and I just start binding around. I'm, I'm like, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Stop fighting right now, you know, whatever. All of a sudden, I see the guy has a big butcher knife in his hand. He stabbed the other guy in the head. Yeah. And as soon as I start binding demons in the guy, he stops fighting that guy, but he looks at me and he starts walking straight toward me. What do you do in that situation? Do you? Stand firm and say, it's my time to go. Let's do it. No, man. That sounds good, but in the moment, I got scared. I would love to tell you that I stood there and I was like, get out in the name of Jesus. And he dropped the knife and was like, no, dude. I was like, oh, this dude's coming at me with a big butcher knife, right? <laughs> Terrified me. But it shook me too. It woke me up and said, man, you know what? Maybe I, maybe I have some areas in my life I need to work on because I need to be able to stand in that situation fearless and full of faith. And in the moment, I wasn't. Uh, so anyway, there was a pastor. I was like, oh, and I tried to walk away, and there's kids around everywhere. Dude's coming straight at me, so I'm thinking I'm the guest speaker. He's trying to kill me. Pastor comes, and he stands in front of me, and he has a, like a chair. He pulls a chair up and turns it upside down, but the guy comes in the middle, and he's just like, he's crazy. You know, he's just like walking around, just, and this guy comes up to try to get him to put the knife down, and, and the guy throws the knife into the ground, and the other guy tries to grab it. And all of a sudden, he grabs it and he goes, Whoosh! and the guy like jumps back. And it's crazy. It's like watching a movie in real life. Crazy. And you can't help, be, be, uh, help but be scared because there's kids around everywhere. Eventually, we get the knife from the guy. He goes off. I was told they called the police. I never saw any police show up. Probably didn't. But I went and checked on the guy who got stabbed in the head. And fortunate, excuse me, fortunately, uh, he wasn't seriously injured. The tip of the knife went into his head, probably only uh, a few centimeters or something. And he was bleeding a lot, but it, it wasn't life-threatening. So you could tell the guy wasn't really trying to kill the other guy. And I had been told they fought a lot, but it's kind of a crazy situation. And uh, it, it shook me for the rest of the night. We have to know that these things are going to happen. When we're out there, we're preaching, we're ministering, we're praying against demons even, it's going to shake up the powers of darkness. And uh, it's not all, you know, I see a lot of people on social media especially would say, oh, you should have bound the demon and cast him. You, you have to understand wisdom in the situation, right? Because if he's not a believer, you cast out the demons. What does the Bible say? He has no protection from those demons coming back. He's going to be more demonized in the end. So to know when the Spirit prompts you to pray for deliverance, we do that. But we have to be led by the Lord in all things. Some other things that happen, you know, Brother David was talking about Honduras. Incredible move of God we saw in Central America. I actually uh, had no plans to go to Central America. I was planning to go to a different country, and 
I would say the month or two leading up to the trip, I had no peace. And I said, God, where do you want me to go? Nothing. Where do you want me to go? I prayed over a time. I look at the map on my phone, and God shows me Central America. And I'm like, really? You want me to go there? I had no thought in my mind to go there. When we went into Tegucigalpa, we had no contacts. It was me, my brother, uh, in Christ, Pastor Stony Ball, who was uh, interpreting for me, and, and Brother uh, Jay, who was running the camera for me. They both spoke Spanish, speak Spanish. I don't. So I needed them, and, and they're good brothers in Christ. But we had no contacts other than ourselves. So we're like, if we have to, we're just going to go preach on the street. We get there. We post our very first street preaching video. Somebody comments on the video. Actually, it was before that. We just did an intro video. They commented and said, brother, call this guy. He'll help you. We called him. He went out with us one day. We did a service in the park, in Central Park. Mighty move of God. We saw people saved, healed, and delivered right there on the street in, in the Central Park of the city. Amazing service. Gave out clothes. Uh, that same day, we saw a guy who had been bound in a wheelchair for 16 years get up and walk. Was on his feet for over 45, minute, uh, for 45 minutes. You can see the video on YouTube. Amazing move of God. Through him, he linked us to another sister in Christ that's there in Honduras who had been working with uh, 18th Street Gang for 20, 30 years, something like that. God, bringing connections. We walk in faith, God will take care of the rest. We get there, he brings us the connections we need. We just trust. We start talking to this lady. She meets us one morning, we go to uh, IHOP. We discuss what we're gonna do. We wanna do a, a big food distribution. So we decide we're going to buy $3,000 worth of food for the 18th Street Gang. They tell us that the only way we can go into this neighborhood is through this woman. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. You, people tell you that a lot, right? Like, oh, yeah. Seriously, though, we get there, and over and over and over again, they tell us, if you weren't with her, you would be killed, and no one would ever find your body. The police don't even go into this neighborhood. The military has a checkpoint right outside of the town. They check you on the way out. That's it. They said a month before that, the, the government went in to do a raid in the same neighborhood. They brought in like, I, I don't want to lie to you, I'm, I, I can't remember the number, but it was something like, uh, like 1,300 people to catch one guy on helicopters into a neighborhood to catch one guy. It was the gang leaders just doing ruthless stuff, murdering and raping and pillaging, just horrible things. They wanted to take him out, so they come in. Uh, over a thousand people on helicopter, and then they finally get the guy. Same place a month later. We come in with three thousand dollars worth of food. Didn't even meet the gang, but we had all the wives and girlfriends together. Did a makeshift gospel preaching for 15 minutes. Three or four of them prayed to follow Jesus, but we were able to move through the neighborhood like we own the place. Even the pastor that went in that community on a regular basis said, I've never seen anybody come in here and feel so comfortable. Little kids holding our hands, that's my heart, as God has given me a heart for the little ones, because that's the future of Christianity in this world. So many of them hurting and broken. Not everybody's called to dangerous missions, but you have to know that God is going to put you in uncomfortable situations. We were able to operate there and really find favor with the 18th Street Gang, so that when we go back there in the future, 100% they're going to remember who we are. And that's important. Because your work isn't going to be able to be done overnight. You have to plant those seeds, let them water, let them grow. And then over time, see that harvest. And we're going to go back in there. We're going to see a harvest in the future. I believe that. The pastor's already told me, we go back there, we're going to do a, not just a crusade in that neighborhood. We're talking about, this is not science fiction or movies. I'm being dead serious with you. Murder and rape happen in this neighborhood all the time. All the time. The taxis won't even go into this neighborhood. That's why the sister in Christ, who's our contact, is so crucial to them. Because she's the only one who will pick up their kids at 3 in the morning and take them to the hospital. You understand? And I could tell you the whole backstory of that offline. But we're going to be able to go back in there in the future, have crusades, have revival, see a harvest. That's the heart of missionary work. Not to, just to go feed the poor, but we're using that as an instrument to see God move in a place that really needs His love, His grace, and His forgiveness. We moved over to El Salvador after that, and we were able to go into a prison. You can see the video on YouTube. But just, um, I, you know, I, I've seen, we went into Pakistan and freed slaves, and, and all this 
other amazing stuff that we've done over the last three years, but this prison visit was the single most impactful event for me. Changed my life. You go in 300 men, hardened men, in there for the rest of their lives. We're talking about South American prison. They have nothing but the little white shorts that they're wearing. They have no shirt, no shoes, no socks, nothing. No toothbrush, nothing. We went in there bringing just essentials, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, soap. Even some of the toothbrushes were pink because it's all we could get. They're so thankful. We go in there, we preach the gospel. We saw a slew of people come up to the front, grown men hardened by the world in a reality that none of us could ever imagine, breaking down in tears in your arms. Only God can do that, my friends. That's the heart of global missions. If we're not reaching the lost, we're not accomplishing what God wants. The whole point of us living out our faith is to worship Him and to reach the lost so that they might worship Him. But they have to find Him before they can know Him. My friends, missionary work is about love. We went into Marawi City. You know, in America, I'm from the United States. I know a lot of you aren't, but in America, the media and movies propagate this hatred towards Islam, okay? Many Americans, this is the, the dead truth, many Americans are afraid of even talking about Islam in public because they think something bad is gonna happen to them. They're terrified of even mentioning Islam in public, right? And we've propagated this hatred towards the religion. But you know what? God wants to save every Muslim in this world. It's the will of God that none should perish. When we were in the Philippines, this is just my, my heart and my mindset. We went into the Philippines. We went to Mindanao, which is notorious to be the most dangerous island in all of Philippines. And on the, de uh, the State Department's website of places you're not allowed to go is this place called Marawi City. So naturally, we get into... Uh, I'm like, we have to go to Marawi City. <laughs> Apparently, a year before that, uh, it's, it's not ISIS, but it's like, uh, they're like wannabe ISIS, and they, they claim affiliation to ISIS. They had gone into Marawi City, and, and literally, you can see a picture on my Facebook where it says, the Islamic city of Marawi, or uh, something like that, Islamic city of Marawi City. The whole city is, is Muslim. Most of the Philippines is Catholic, but this whole city is just Islam. And a year before, some extremists had gone in and, uh, and overtaken the city, and the Filipino government came in, and they had war. Half the city was destroyed. You drive through there, it looks like a war zone. Half the city completely destroyed. They have big fence with signs on it saying, don't go into this place. Everybody's looking at you crazy because you have light skin. We had no contacts in Marawi City, but we bought a bunch of food, and we're like, we're going to find somebody to feed. So, driving into the city, we see these big UNICEF shelters on the left. And at first, the pastor that I'm with, he didn't want to go in there. He's scared. I said, brother, God is with you. If you die, praise God, you're going to be with Jesus. <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard to live by. What's the worst that could happen? You die, praise God. Amen. The best reality you could ever know is now nice. staring you in the face. <laughs> if you're living in the spirit, you're walking in the spirit, that's where you're at, right? Right? If you're living in the flesh, you're going to cling to this life. So we go in there, and I'm all about just being kind, showing respect and compassion towards other people. We go into, into the, we talk to the guy who's running the, the little shelter area. We say, hey, man, we got some food. We just want to feed as many people as we can. We're Christians. We, hopefully, if you don't mind, we can share our faith. But if you don't want us to, that's okay, too. We just want to show the love of God. Dude's like, yeah, man, cool. His dad was actually the one who ran the place, but he just kind of let us operate, you know? By the time we left, these little kids were telling us they loved us. We were there for 45 minutes, an hour. You can see the video on YouTube. That's why videos are important. I'm all about capturing moments because I want to stir your heart. I want you to feel the love of God. It's not to lift us up or to give us glory. There's no glory to be had. A lot of people, they say, oh, how are you posting all the street preaching videos? Street preaching is by far, I think you could attest to this, right, Pastor? Street preaching is the most despised, 
disrespected form of evangelism and ministry in the entire body of Christ. If you want to be famous or puffed up, lifted up, you're not going to choose street preaching as a profession. It's just, that's the case. We do this because we're desperate for souls. Amen. We're desperate to reach the lost by any means necessary. And that's where we have to stay. So we fed these kids and, and it impacted them. I guarantee you, and that's the beauty that I see in my life. I have pictures of all these memories on my wall in my apartment, but these kids are never going to forgive or forget us. Years down the road, they're living in shelters a year after. How can this be? That's the heart of global missions, to reach the needy, the downtrodden, the forgotten. Show them Jesus. I could give you stories for days, but, you know, it's not all about developing countries either. We see a lot of persecution, difficulty, danger in first world countries like Canada. Pastor David Lynn going through what he's going through right now with the, you know, the legal system. And we see uh, a lot of persecution against me when I was in Australia. Uh, I preached on a train. If those of you who aren't familiar, I was in Sydney in the financial district and I preached on a train and I brought up some social issues. I said, how is it that we care more about the whales, saving the, the whales than we do about saving our unborn children? And uh, the whole train turned against me and it was, it was nuts. And uh, it ended up going international, or not international, but national news. Uh, two different uh, primetime talk shows in Australia invited me to come talk. I turned them down, but uh, the whole thing was skewed towards hatred of Christianity, of us trying to impose our religion onto them. There is a hatred of God in this world. There is a spirit of blasphemy, spirit of atheism that's running rampant in our first world countries, in these, these countries that are capitalist societies that are doing well financially. They have everything they want. Why do I need Jesus if my bank account is full and I have a different woman in my bed every night or I'm getting, uh, and I'm getting full at the club or whatever, you don't understand. People who are full of the world, they don't know it, but they're sick. It's like eating McDonald's every day. They're never going to be satisfied, but they're deceived. And the only way that they're going to see the truth is if God takes away those scales. That's why we preach. We go out on the streets and we preach so that the scales might be removed. Amen. So we go out. Last time I was here uh, at the beginning of June, uh, we had a joint effort to go into the was to the homeless where the a lot of the addicts and the those who are struggling live to be able to give them food and to bring them juice and to witness to them and I had a guy spit in my face even those who are at the lowest of low here in in these societies that we take for granted that there's a hatred towards God so we have to be mindful that we're in a spiritual war we can't force God as much as we want to, we want, you know, sometimes we want to just like stick a needle in and say, you will have Jesus or bash him on the head. I don't know. You know, like you're like, why can't you just see the truth? Your life could change. Amen. But we can't. We just have to pray. The spirit realm is where we have to be fighting. There's a guy that's 70 years old that emails me all the time. He hates God. His dad was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, Brought him up in Christianity his whole life. He hates God. He doesn't believe in God. But you can tell he does. He's just mad at God. But he says he hates or he doesn't believe in God. And he sends me articles, like probably dozens a week. I have a fondness for this man. I think God's going to reach him. Because he wouldn't email me so much if his heart wasn't troubled. Right? But it's people like that that we have to continue working to try to reach in the spirit, I mean, we have to pray, we have to show kindness, we, we, we have to persevere, Amen. right? But the persecution is going to be against us. We get out there on the street, we preach, it's going to stir up some ruckus, like Pastor was saying. Every time we get together, the cops show up, the news shows up, the handcuffs show up, it's crazy. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. A lot of people look at me crazy on Facebook, they'll Posts about something terrible happened. I'm like, praise God. And they're like, oh, how could you say? Praise God in everything. Praise God. Doesn't matter what happens. How do we reach the lost? We preach. We, testi uh, we testify through our life. 
We show love through providing necessities, distribution of goods. What are some other ways we might reach the lost with the gospel of Christ? There's no like specific right answer. I don't have a list in my head. I'm just Prayer. looking for feedback. Prayer. Hmm? Prayer. Prayer. Yeah, we war in the spirit. Prayer can change a heart much quicker than any other means. Sharing Anything else? Compassion. Sharing social media. Social media, Sharing absolutely. Showing compassion. Compassion, yeah. The testimony of our life. If people see Jesus in us. Amen. Right. That's a good one too, yeah. People are downtrodden. We show compassion and love, mercy. Gospel tracks. See, you know, I have a friend. A lot of people will say, you know what, gospel tracks, I don't, I don't even pass out as many as I, I used to. I have a friend who was saved because he went to do number two in a gas station and he found a track there and he picked it up and he was saved. It works. So hand out a track. Put it somewhere. I don't do this as much as I used to, but every time I used to pump gas, I would talk to somebody. Hand them a track say, hey, man, God loves you. Right? Anything that we do can impact the kingdom of God. I have so many stories I could share with you. When I was in Israel, I preached in Jerusalem and several different places. About a year later, a woman mess or commented on one of my videos and she said, last year, she said, I thank God I finally found you. Last year, I went to Jerusalem for the first time. I'm a Palestinian Muslim, or I was. And I went to Jerusalem for the first time. And when I was there, I heard you preaching, and it made me angry. But I left, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And eventually, I gave my heart to God, and now my whole family's saved. And it took me like six months, but I finally found you. What? <laughs> it's incredible, right? But how many stories happen like that all the time? We're never going to hear. We're never going to hear. So many stories I could share with you. People are watching, they're listening. That's why the power of social media, we have to use it. Forget about all the haters and the people who criticize and say, oh, you're just trying to show your works and you're gonna lose your rewards and forget about all that. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good deeds and glorify God who is in heaven. Amen. God knows your heart. Amen. And if you're doing it to be seen of men, God's still gonna be glorified. You probably will lose your rewards. <laughs> But if your heart is right, God's going to preserve that. Amen. He's looking at your heart. Amen. All right. Fear. How many is afraid to evangelize? If we were to go out today and said, preach the gospel, you'd be like, I, I, I can't do it. I'm afraid. Just be real. Yeah, sometimes. So quite a few of you. How do we overcome fear? I'm not going to give you a super spiritual answer today. I'm going to give you practical advice. Go ahead. You overcome fear. This may sound backwards, but you overcome fear with a different kind of fear. You overcome the worldly fear with the godly fear. Godly fear? That's a good answer. Right. My godly fear that drives me to obedience is greater than my worldly fear of the, of the acceptance of man, right? Fear of rejection, fear of ridicule is very real. A lot of us are very afraid of what the world might think. But I want you to also consider that the world is not rejecting you when you preach or evangelize. They're rejecting Christ. Now, that should probably hurt us more, but we can also separate the two and know if I were to go out preaching any other thing, that we would probably be accepted. If we're not preaching Santa Claus, they would be entertained. One of my friends here that lives in Toronto, he was on a trip with me. Uh, we went to, a couple of years ago, we went to Greece and... Uh, It's right next to it. It starts with a B. Bulgaria. We were in Thessaloniki. He had never preached before. First time he got out there, it was at nighttime. There was 20 people that were waiting on a boat to come pick him up, to take him on a birthday cruise. He goes out there and he starts, he said, if I could just talk to you for a minute. For five minutes, it seemed like the crowd was hanging on every single word he said. But he hadn't said anything about Jesus yet. He's just telling a story about his life. And they're just hanging on every word, so interested. And at a certain point, he drops Jesus. And he said, and Jesus changed my life. You know what they did? They went, oh, and they walked away. It was the name of Jesus that changed everything. 
So just keep in mind, if you're talking about any other thing, they're going to accept you. It's Jesus that they hate. Don't internalize it. Don't make it personal. Understand that this is what we're called to. But I also have more practical advice for you. In graduate school, one of my, uh, my teachers told me about overcoming discomfort, uncomfortability with uh, putting yourself in that position as much as possible. And that's what I want to challenge you today to do. If you're, especially if you're called to evangelism, if you're called to missionary work, you're called to public speaking of some sort and you have a fear of it, put yourself in an uncomfortable situation as often as you can. If you get to a point where preaching in public is no longer fearful to you, think of a, a place that might be fearful. Maybe even the mall where you know you're going to get kicked out and you're like, I don't know. What Do it. What's going to happen? You get kicked out. So what? You go back the next day, they won't even remember you. Right? Or just go to the other side of the mall and do it again. That's what I do. Cops come, they say, can you please stop? I'm like, sure, I go to the next street corner. Who cares? But if you continually put yourself in uncomfortable situations, eventually the uncomfortable becomes comfortable. I remember when I first started preaching on the streets. It was uncomfortable. I had apprehension. I never really struggled with fear too much, but I had an apprehension. It was hard to actually start doing it. Once I did, it was fine. I remember when I was in the military at 20, 21 years old, I, started, I was starting on my bachelor's degree. We had to do a two-minute presentation. Two minutes, you had to talk in front of your class of like 10 people. I was terrified. You get up there and you're like, in 2003, index card, it's bad. I can't tell you the last time I was afraid to talk in public. It just doesn't happen. Eventually, if you keep doing it, you're not even going to think about it anymore. And the power of God will be with you. That's the most important thing. Be full of the Spirit. So many people ask me on social media, Brother Philip, how do I start? How do I get out there and do it? How do I get rid of the fear? Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in your own flesh. You're not going to be able to get through these situations in your own flesh. But if God is with you, who can be against you? It's powerful. Do we need a break? Do we need five minutes? Go ahead. I was going to say the one, big, one of the biggest things for me is to be strong in the Word. Yeah. Because right? it's the start of the Spirit. So, you know, the stronger you are in the Word, then the, you know, um, the right uh, end response. Like, you know, you know what God, God's will is and you know the desire um, for Him and, and for yourself, too. The Spirit is in us and convicts us. Like, you know, that Amen. needs to be saved now. If we don't know God's word, we're not equipped to do God's work anyway, right? The only thing that's going to get us through, that's our, that's our weapon. If you think about it, we talk about the armor of God in Ephesians 6. It's the only offensive weapon we have besides our shoes to run. Everything else is defensive. We have to use the sword of the Spirit. We have to be able to speak God's word in faith. How many people comment on videos on social media and say, Brother Philip, you need to get out there with a Bible and just preach God's Word. If they knew God's Word, they would understand I'm using a lot of Scripture in my preaching, but they don't recognize it because I'm not saying in Luke chapter 4, verse speak God's Word in faith. It doesn't have to be verbatim. There's power in our words as we speak in faith. It's our faith that activates the power of God. Conversely, it's our doubt and our unbelief that deactivates the power of God. If you go out there and you could, you could preach Bible scripture for days, but if you have fear, doubt, and unbelief in your heart, you're not going to accomplish what God has for you. You have to overcome doubt and unbelief. You have to. How do we do that? Know God's word. Be prayed up. Fast. Fasting is a humbling of the flesh, a breaking of the flesh. Because if we're puffed up, God can't use us the way He wants. I've preached before that we need to spend time on our knees in prayer. We need to spend time on our faces. I like to get on my face when I pray. And this is, you know, I don't do this much in public, corporately, but in my, my private time, getting on my face before God. 
And I'll have people that come and say, well, I don't really, do, do I really have to do that though? Isn't that just like me showing piety or is it really necessary? Well, if, huh? Yeah, and it's like if, if my heart is too puffed up to get on my face, then I'm clearly too puffed up, right? And there's a humbling that needs to happen. If we're too proud to get on our face before God, there's some work that God needs to do in us. At the same time, I have never felt more power, more faith, more love, more joy, more peace, more intimacy and closeness with God than when I've been on my face. When we go out there on the, on the street, we preach, that's not where the favor of God is found. We talked about this at the beginning. The favor of God is found on your face, in prayer, on your knees, in His Word. David, King David, he didn't earn the favor of God through his great and mighty feats because it was the power of God that enabled him to do that anyway. God can use anybody. The favor of God is found in us seeking His face and us searching Him, searching for His heart, searching for His face, searching for His goodness, trying to go deeper. We hear the world when I say the world, the church is talking about elevation all the time. When are we going to start talking about going deeper with God? Extend my reach. Help me to go deeper into your ocean of love. A few months ago, God spoke to me on um, people are trying to build castles on the ocean. Instead of going into the depths of his love, which is that vast ocean, we're trying to build castles on the, on the ocean. We're trying to get as high as we can to build our own kingdom. Let us be forgotten so that he might be glorified. So we overcome fear with faith, trust, overcoming doubt and unbelief. Fear keeps us paralyzed and ineffective. Getting started can be scary, but once we do it, we begin to have more confidence, faith, trust. We understand God's role for our life. God's not going to give you the whole picture. He's not going to lay it out before you as a as a whole storyline and then give you the book to read so that you can go over it before you start walking out in faith. He's going to give you breadcrumbs. He's going to give you a little bit at a time. And I'm going to preach about that tonight. So I don't want to go into any more depth on that. You have to walk in faith because if God showed you everything, you would say, okay, God, thanks. And you'd go over here and start trying to do it on your own. We love to do that as humans, but God keeps us searching, keeps us praying, keeps us wanting so that we're continually having to go to him. Because that's what he wants ultimately. He wants us to worship him, to love him. That's the, the heart of all of this. Overcoming fear. I remember when I first came back to the Lord, God pressed on my heart so strongly to pray for this guy outside of a convenience store. I was terrified. I even went out to my, my truck and I said, I can't do it. I sat there for a minute, and it was so strong. I said, all right, I have to do this. He was a disabled man. He was inside. I went up to him, and I said, hey, man, I really feel led to pray for you. Can I? And he said, sure. I said, can we go outside so nobody hears us? We go outside. And I'm going to tell you, I prayed, and it was awful. This dude was standing there like, what? <laughs> I don't even know if it made sense. It was bad. I said, I told you, Lord, I can't do this. We all start somewhere. We all start somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for giving me the grace to be able to pray. We get better over time. That's why I, I try to teach to my sons, like, just do it. Nobody's grading you. Nobody's criticizing you. We're in this together. And if you go out there and you preach and it's difficult, it might sound awful to you. You might be preaching and the whole time you're like, man, this is terrible. You shouldn't be in that mindset, but some of you might be. I know that it's happened. Push through. Realistically, it might be terrible, but eventually it's going to get better. Nobody is going to be grading you or criticize you. We're going to lift you up. We're going to pray for you. God's going to breathe life into your soul, and you're going to see fruit abound to your account regardless. And you go out there and you say, God, if I just reach one soul, let it be. Amen. One soul. Because we hear those stories of one soul being converted and they go on to impact nations and kingdoms. One soul. I remember as I was still working out on the oil rig, uh, God commissioning me to ministry. 
And he showed me for the first time that he wanted me to drive around the United States over about eight days to go to different places. He didn't even tell me where to go. Just the night before, I opened up my, my maps on my phone. I was supposed to do a deliverance the next morning. I, she was supposed to come to where we were. There was a little boy I needed to pray over and herself who needed deliverance. And they were going to drive from Alabama to Mississippi. And the night before, God told me to leave the next morning. And I said, I can't do it, Lord. I, what? To leave by myself, to drive across? I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do it. So the next morning, I'm driving down the road, crying my eyes out. I say, I'm doing it, Lord. Amen. Give me strength. And I bawled my eyes out. I'm saying, like a little kid, it was bad. And it was beautiful. I was broken. Like an hour into the trip, I stopped at a gas station. God prompted me to pray for the woman on the other side of the pump. She was yelling at her son. Her son's like 18, 19. She's yelling at him. I'm like, what's wrong with this woman? Why is she so angry? I said, ma'am, can I pray for you? She said, sure. I just prayed. And, and this was, I don't do this anymore. I should. But this is a time in my faith where, like, I want the world to hear me. So I'm at a gas station. I'm like, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would bring it. It's just, it was awesome. I, I need to do that more often. But she was shook by it. And there was a woman walking by. She's like, praise God. You know, I was like, amen, sister. I'm just so emboldened. I'm like, Lord, see, I'm doing it. <laughs> but after I prayed, this woman began to tell me her story and about how her daughter has stage four terminal lung cancer and about how her, her grandson, the, the woman who has cancer, her son, had just been involved in a car accident a couple of months before and was completely paralyzed from the neck down, couldn't move, pretty much vegetative state. And about how the world was crumbling around her, her whole world's falling apart. And I said, okay, God, I understand. I know what you're doing now. That same trip was the very first time I street preached. A couple of days after that event, I was in uh, Cincinnati. And I just went out with some brothers who were street preaching. I had never street preached before. I wasn't going to street preach, but I said, hey, I'll, I'll pray for people. And I went out and I saw this brother, Brother Ryan Kittle, walking down the street like a crazy man, raising his hand, and he's just, da, 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 he's just preaching. And I was like, wow. And I, we've all seen those crazy street preachers that just get out there, and they're just like vile and vicious. and <clears throat> That's not so memorable. But to see somebody walking in the power of God down the street, seeing the Holy Ghost speaking through them, and you just, wow. It impacted me. We saw amazing things that day, just praying for people. We saw the power of God just overwhelm us, the tangible presence of God. A couple of days later, I was in Detroit. God gave me a, a vision during that trip to go to Detroit. I went there and met with a couple of people. We were out on the streets, and I preached for the first time. And I'm going to tell you, I've never experienced the presence of God like I did that day in Detroit ever again, and, and, and even before that. And I was saved in a very dramatic way. All right, God poured out his spirit on me at 15, and, and, and I could tell you the story offline, but it was a very incredible experience, but still to this day, I've never encountered God like I did on that boardwalk in Detroit. The, the presence of God, Pastor, was so tangible, so heavy, it's like you could cut it with a knife. So heavy was his presence on the boardwalk. I couldn't even control the words that I was preaching. I would begin to preach, and I couldn't stop. It was like he had opened up the gate and it was just the river of life coming out. And, and we were preaching to Muslims, preaching to all sorts of people. And they were like, I really like what you're saying. And you could just see all the defenses. There was a guy who came up who was uh, very mocking. And he was recording. He was mocking what we were doing. And I looked at him. I preached at him. And you see his, his defenses break down. It's like, I really like what you're doing. And he ran off. You know, it's just... <laughs> At the end of it, I'm walking down the boardwalk and I'm preaching about how God wants to heal the city of Detroit. And there's like 50 people sitting underneath this awning. It's like a concession stand. I don't know what you would call it here. Did you all call it that here in Canada? It's like a, like a food booth kind of thing. As I get there, I'm preaching and I stop and I finish what I'm saying. And like half of those, half the crowd starts clapping. I'm like, what? First time I ever street preached in my life. I was like, Wow. This is incredible. And, and unfortunately, it can't be like that every time. 
God's not going to give us that grace every time. He gave it that day, but, and I, trust me, I, I would love to encounter God in that heavy, manifest way again, and I'm sure it will happen. What I'm saying is, though, is if we just step out in faith, I was bawling my eyes out at the beginning of this trip saying, I can't do it. That day, we had like 12 different people throughout praying for God to forgive them, praying to follow Jesus. Within a couple of hours, they're on the boardwalk. Powerful stuff if we just trust God that he's going to get us through it. So my point is, overcoming fear is only done by the power of God and trusting in him, stepping out in faith. And when we do that, he helps us to become more comfortable. We're going to be attacked. We're going to see uh, difficulties. We're going to see the struggle become real. And we're not always going to have the resources that we need. We're not always going to... No, don't get me wrong. I stand on the promise that God supplies every need. What I'm saying is we're not always going to have everything we think we need. God's going to use that to strengthen us, to grow us in our faith, to help us to understand that we can operate on less, that we can always operate with more grace. All right, who has their Bible? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be a lot more scripture heavy tonight during the sermon, but I do have a couple of scriptures for you today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. I have the KJV. We're going to read verse 8 through verse uh, 18. It says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made, made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. Do we believe? If we don't believe, we can't speak. But we speak because we know the one whom we have believed. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up, also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the, abundance, that the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh us for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary or temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? Amen. We're running towards the eternal things. We're walking in the Spirit of God. We know the one whom we have believed. Whether we're in Pakistan freeing slaves or in Uganda helping orphanages. Whether we're in Honduras visiting uh, 18th Street Gang, or whether we're in Colombia out on the street preaching to pimps and prostitutes, I've done all of that. But the objective is the same, the purpose is the same, and the execution is the same. I know in whom I have believed, and I'm going to testify. I'm going to speak on that. And I'm going to know down to the depths of my soul that His power, His Spirit can change your life. If I don't believe it, how is somebody else going to? How can I convince them if I'm not living that testimony? But we have to know it down to our bones. If we're in chains, if we're tied at the stake and they're going to light us on fire, we have to know in the one whom we have believed. That's why we have testimony of, of brothers and sisters in the faith who've been, they've been burned at the stake and they sung praises and they laughed while they were getting burned. I've, seen te or I've read testimony of men who watched this whole family being executed right in front of him. They took his infant child and it says they dashed his child to pieces against the wall. How are we going to make it through that? Eventually he escaped. Right after that, he was able to preach the gospel. How can you live after you've lost your entire family? How can you testify of his goodness in the midst of such difficulty? A couple of years ago, it's been about this time, two years ago, I lost 80% of everything I own in a hurricane. Hurricane Harvey, I'm sure you heard of it. I was living, uh, see, when I worked offshore for, for Shell, I made really good money. Uh, and that never mattered. Actually, it, it mattered to me when I was in the world, but that did not matter to me at the time. But what I'm saying is when 
I went into full-time ministry, I went from like six figures to like no figures, you understand? I was laid off, had no job, had no donors, no sponsors, nothing. But I always said, God, if, if this job ends, which they just cut our position, the oil prices crashed and I was like one of the last to let go, but they laid us off and they just cut the position entirely. And I said, God, if this ever happens to me, I'm just going to run in faith and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in full-time ministry because I know that's what you've called me to. And I had that season of praying that I talked to you about at the beginning. And when it began, I went through a season of difficulty. I was selling all my stuff at pawn shops to pay my rent. I mean, I was buying dollar soap at the dollar. Don't ever do that, by the way. It's a dollar for a reason. It's not good. You buy good soap. It will last you three times longer. And it's worth the $3. But I was doing these things to survive. And God, and it's such a long story. I can't tell you in this forum, but God used testimony after testimony to increase my faith of I went through the season where I wouldn't let anybody know my needs. This was way before the hurricane. It's about a year before the hurricane. And I, I didn't tell anybody my needs. And I said, God, I'm going to pray to you. And if you want to help me, you'll burden other people's hearts to help. And I tested the faithfulness of God. Not in a bad way, but saying, God, I trust you. And I know that you're going to be true to your promises, that you're going to take care of me. And I wrote a list of scriptures. I could send it to anybody who's interested. And I prayed through these scriptures. And I, I, I changed the wording to fit my own life, right? Like, for the example, the, the verse that says, sow in tears so that you might reap in joy, right? I would say, Lord, I'm sowing in tears so that I might reap in joy. I'm standing on this promise. Please help. And I would just change it to fit my own life so I could pray for it directly over myself. And I stood on those promises and time and time again, God would provide. I remember days in prayer, I would be praying for something very specific. And while I'm praying, I would get an alert on my phone and it would be the exact answer to prayer that I was looking for. It's amazing. Test the faithful. No, not in a bad way. I'm just saying pray in faith. Pray in faith and believe. Trust that God is going to be faithful. But it's going to be with hardship. It's going to be with difficulty. He's going to put you through the storm to strengthen you. He's got to break you down before he can build you up. A lot of us are broken clay. We're broken vessels. And God takes us through that season early in our faith where we cry a lot and he heals us. He covers the cracks and the divots and the, the brokenness and he molds us into that new vessel. And not only that, over time, he makes us a bigger vessel so he can pour more into us so that we can pour out more onto the world. But it comes in tears. The healing of the soul comes through tears and it's good tears. It's beautiful tears, but you're going to cry. And the only way you're going to cry is if God puts you through the situation. Praise God. Praise God. So two years ago, I lost 80% of everything I owned. I was living in an RV at the time. Um, I had bought an RV before, and then through my situation, I just I, I moved into it. And I was living this. I wanted all my resources to be able to go towards the work that I was doing. And um, my family wanted me to leave when the hurricane was coming, but we honestly didn't think it was going to impact us that much. And... Uh, Unfortunately, that was not the case. I, I did feel that God was telling me to stay put. And what they did is they opened up a dam and it released like millions of gallons, uh, liters, I guess, of water. And it washed down river. The river overflowed and my truck, my, my RV, and 80% of everything I owned was, was flooded out. I lost all my military awards, military uniforms, just pretty much everything. Uh, all my... my my Christian books and my Bibles were up in the shelf on, on the ceiling, so all of that was spared, praise God, but, amen, uh, but pretty much everything I lost, and I had to live with my mom in Northeast Texas for about five months, and it was a very difficult season. I remember being broken and praying and saying, God, I can't do this. I remember throughout my faith, throughout this walk, that when I'm at my most broken, I feel that that's when God hears us the most. Right? We want those broken seasons because I have seen God move in such astonishing ways in those broken moments. If you want ministry, if you want evangelism, you want to, to really be commissioned to go out and you have to be commissioned. God has to, to send you out. You can't just decide, hey, I think this looks cool. Let's do it. It's not a career field that we just choose. God has to call you. And when he calls you to this work, he's going to put a burning in your heart. He's going to put a weight on your soul. There's a burden that we carry for those who are in ministry. And you have to be prepared to carry that weight. You understand? I understand there's a verse where Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He's going to give us a new yoke and all that. But we're going to carry godly burdens. 
We're going to carry godly burdens. There's a, a weight of responsibility that we carry as ministers of the faith. You have to know that God has called you to this. And when you do, he's going to begin working something amazing in your life. Who needs a break? I have, I have quite a lot to, hold on. I have quite a lot. To, I'm going to try to rush through some of this. I don't want to rush too much, but take five minutes if you can, and then we're going to meet back. Uh, we want to get into more of the practical stuff at this point. I want to help you understand some of the mission objectives. Uh, if you want to be a part of a missionary team or, or, or form one, if God has called you to that and he's commissioned you to that at some point, the importance, uh, definitely the impetus is on you being called to do that. Okay? Uh, and God will prepare you. He will put you in, uh, he, will, he will definitely situate you in, in that time and opportunity to do that. But if you feel that you are led to do this, or even if you're not, it's good to be knowledgeable. We're going to talk about it. I hope that you can internalize this and take it with you. We're going to talk about a, kind of a myriad of different things. First thing I want to cover is understanding the mission objectives. We've talked about this at length, but it really is just to reach the world with the, uh, with the gospel, to reach the lost with the heart of Christ, to help them know him so that they might worship him. We don't want anyone to go to hell. That's our motivation every day. I've preached this. I believe it. We are running down the edge of a cliff as crowds of people, multitudes, by the innumerable multitudes, are falling off of this cliff into damnation and destruction every moment. And we are running down the length of this cliff, snatching as many souls from the edge as we can, desperately. And we need to take a desperate approach. Not desperate as in haphazardly, but desperate as in we need to be focused, not... Uh, distracted by worldly things, not taken aside by things that don't matter. I see so many Christians that go down the rabbit hole on things that really just don't matter. And they're reading all these extra biblical books and studying all of these, you know, I, I understand eschatology is extremely interesting, but if it becomes a distraction, then we need to set aside and focus on the gospel, focus on our relationship. Are we watching YouTube for hours and not praying for hours? What are we doing? And are we prepared to do the work that God has called us to? And I'm, I'm firm on that. We have to be focused. The enemy wants to steal our time, get us out of position. God might want to bless you and prepare you, but if you're out of position to receive from him, you're not going to catch what he's trying to give you. A couple of years ago, I had a dream that I was trying to catch a train. And I was walking, taking my time to the train station very distracted and I got to the uh, ticket counter and I bought my ticket and as I got my ticket I turned and looked over to the station I realized the train was leaving I began to run and as I got closer to the train it left the station and I missed the train I looked over and there was a group of buses in two columns and I was like wow I can catch the bus I began to run over to the buses to try to catch them and as I got closer the buses left the station and I missed the bus and I remember going up to the top of this hill and seeing this desert landscape all around me. And I knew that I had missed my train. And it would be a time before I would be able to catch the next one. I was in a wilderness season at that point. And this can speak to our lives because if we're out distracted by the things of the world, if we're not going about the Father's business, if we're not ready to receive from God, whether it's opportunity or responsibility or blessing or whatever, if we're not in the position to receive from God, we're going to miss our train. We're going to face delays. We're going to get unnecessary attacks against us. Disobedience brings an opening for the enemy to attack us. When we're disobedient, we're in sin. And it gives opportunity for us to be attacked. And we miss out on the blessings that God has for us. Being positioned is extremely important. So understand the mission objectives. Every mission is different. My objective going into Central America, I knew, was to reach the gangs. The 18th Street Gang in Honduras, MS-13, and El Salvador. God made that happen. We didn't even have contacts. We went there in faith knowing, God, I know you're sending me. You're going to work it out. It was greater than anything I ever could have planned on my own. Right? But it's a lot different than when we go into Pakistan and we're freeing slaves from the brick kilns or preaching in village churches where at any moment Muslims might show up and burn, their whole church, or burn, burn the whole village down. We have to know what we're doing, know what we're talking about. 
We have to understand the mission objectives. We have to be focused on what God has called us to in that specific region for that specific time. But the heart is always to reach them with the gospel. The execution might look a little bit different. Are we f distributing food? Are we going to be preaching a revival, crusade? Are we going to be on the streets preaching? Are we going to be planting churches? Torch of Christ Ministries, we haven't done a lot of church planting. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, Brother, I want to start a Torch of Christ church in several different African countries and Asia. I said, Brother, God hasn't led me to do it. I would love to plant churches everywhere, but if God hasn't called me to it, if He's not leading me to do it, we have one church right now in Myanmar. And God specifically put that on my heart. Until He lays something else in my heart, I'm not going to do it. We shouldn't just be moving to move or working just to work or thinking, hey, this looks good, let's do it. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Some of us are called to church planting. Others, not so much. I mean, we're all going to eventually build up fellowships that can go out and create other fellowships. That's not what I'm saying is Paul was called to specifically go out and plant. Brother David called to plant, right? We have different areas of ministry we operate in. You have to know what God is calling you to and focus on just that. What resources do we need to accomplish the objective? You don't always have to have it in your hand when you go. I remember going, the, actually the trip where I met Brother David in London. I left, I would say a couple of days before I left to go to London, I had like $32 in my account or something. Crazy. I said, Lord, I'm just going to go in faith. And God provided and praise God, I'm not in that situation anymore. God brought me from all of the hardships of hurricanes. And we have a very big and, and expansive donor network. And God, He brings that about just by us showing the work. We're not out trying to raise money. I can't, it's been over a year since I've done a fundraiser. Because we don't need to anymore. We show the work. We let our light shine and God, and God will bring people. People want to be a part of the work. They're going to volunteer their resources, their time, their prayer. How many people intercede on behalf of Christ Forgiveness Ministries, on behalf of Torch of Christ Ministries for the work that we're doing? And we don't have to ask people, but God puts it on their heart and He burdens them. These are important resources. Prayer is one of the most important you could ever, ever ask for. But God gives you that network as you go out and you do the work. You walk in faith. You know, He sent them out and He said, don't take anything. So that we go out, we, we do that. We let our light shine. We show the work and God brings us what we need. Amen. Day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight in the sermon as well. But early on, uh, realistically, I know practically, we might need to fundraise early on. I know in early on in, in my days, I've had to do fundraising in the past. There's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is we need to have a faith that God is going to bring us what we need. And there are different avenues in which we can do that. I'm not big on begging. As a child of God, we are not beggars. We are Amen. children of the King. Amen. He's taken us off the streets as spiritual orphans. He's brought us into His kingdom. We can sit at His table and eat with Him. He wraps us in a robe of righteousness. We are able to feast as He feasts. We're part of His body, and He would never deny Himself. That's why He's never going to deny us. We have faith in that. We're not beggars, Amen. ever. So there's a difference between fundraising and begging. We have to know the difference. Pray. Do we have contacts in place? If you don't have contacts in place in a specific country, then maybe uh, reach out on Facebook, social media, great ways. I just took my oldest son to Puerto Rico on his first mission trip, and I didn't have a contact in place until less than a week before we went. And I like planning a little bit more than, than what that entailed, but it worked out pretty great. And it was a very memorable trip for my son. And uh, I want to just be mindful of that. I want us to be mindful of that. You don't have to have everything in place if you have enough faith, but it's better to have it in place. Know who your contacts are. Uh, have a good foundation, a good network or, or base there. You want to have a base camp. And, and you want to be able to communicate uh, clearly with them what your objectives, your goals, and your focus is. I'm going to India in, in three weeks. And the people I'm going to be visiting, I've already met before. I was in India May of last year, and I worked with these same individuals. And they like to kind of take what you want to do and run with it and, and do a whole nother thing. And they'll run you to death if you let them, right? Because they're so amped up to work. And, and you might be with them for three days, but the whole trip is 14. And, and you've got to be able to, to last. It's a marathon. 
and you face different difficulties. You're guaranteed you're going to get sick to your stomach. You're going to uh, be tired and, and sleep deprived. You're going to not be able to pray and read your Bible as much as what you want. That's why you have to be full of the Word when you go. Fast before you go. You're not going to be able to pray for hours in country like you can when you're at home. Right? So you have to be full to be able to walk through that desert. Like when, when God sent Elijah, right? For a time without food or water, we have to be willing to go through that desert when we're fighting the good fight against the enemy while knowing that we're not going to be able to read or pray as much as we want to. And you try as much as you can, but realistically, your time is going to be very, very, very eventful, jam-packed, but amazing. And that's really just uh, the highlight of everything. You go to India, you preach to 100 Hindus, 98 of them are going to raise their hand and follow Jesus. They fight each other so that you can pray over them. It's just incredible. Not everywhere is like that, but people are hungry for the Word of God all throughout the world. They're starved. You know, Hindus are, I think, one of the easiest people groups to reach because they believe in thousands of God. They're, they're, it's like they're searching everywhere. So you don't have to worship the sun, the moon, and the trees. You can worship the creator of the sun, the moon, and the trees. And they understand that. They get that. You don't have to go out and say, lay down your idols. Just say, he's God of gods. You don't have to worship any of these other things. We always take them through a prayer to renounce all of that. But laying it out, helping them see how God can impact their life. These, these individuals, they have nothing. They have nothing. They don't know when their next meal is going to come from. And yet they'll scrounge something up just so you can eat. Knowing that you have far more resources than they could ever have. They, they're just kind-hearted, good people. But they need Jesus. And God sends us out. Not just to reach them, but to stir up the pastors, the preachers, evangelists. Workers there who are Indians or Pakistanis or wherever they are to continue the work once you've left. So that's another objective we look at. Not just to preach the gospel and to reach the lost, but to stir up hearts that are in country that continue the work when you've left. We're talking specifically short-term missions. If you're going for a long-term mission, you're living in country, it's a little bit more easy for you to uh, have a, a base, a network, to disciple, to have a congregation. If God has called you to pastor, but short-term missions, we want to stir up the hearts of the leaders there so they can continue the work. How do we do that? We have to live by example. We have to be able to demonstrate the power of God. As Paul said, I come not in excellency of speech or in the wisdom of men, but what? Y'all know this verse? Demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. Demonstrating deliverance, healing, praying in faith, seeing souls brought into the kingdom of God. Looking at transport, team size, lodging, mobility, time available are all very important things. Do you have the ability to transport 15 people on a mission? I would love to take a group of 30 people, but realistically, I can't hire four vans to lug us around everywhere we're going. So I travel in small teams. It's just easier for me. Lodging, much easier. You get one van, you're going to have a lot of locals with you anyway. And you're going to be able to travel. Your mobility is greatly increased. And I think it's more effective to have smaller teams. So typically in, in my groups, when we do missions, we take a group of about three. And I think it's a really good number, sometimes four. Um, if you have the ability to take a larger group, praise God. I think the, the spiritual dynamic is greater. I think you're going to see the power of God move in a greater way. Where more of you together come together in one mind and one accord, you're going to see the Spirit of God move. But the heart of what I do is to stir up the locals, to stir up the local population. When I was in Indonesia, I've been there twice. Uh, we stirred up, God sent me there to do a, the second time, to do a youth rally. And I had no idea, but when I went there, it was the Indonesian uh, Independence Day. And a church was able to get a bus and load up about 75 kids. 18, 19, 20 years old. And this is the largest Muslim nation in the world, you understand? Bigger than Pakistan, bigger than uh, Iran or Afghanistan, more Indonesian Muslims than any other country in the world. Christians are terrified to practice their faith in Indonesia. Officials, authorities stand in their services and listen to what they're preaching and teaching. They have blasphemy laws. 
one of the leaders, I think it was the governor of Jakarta or something like that, mayor of Jakarta, a couple of years ago, he said publicly on, over the media, said that you should not let your imam tell you who to vote for. Pray and, and, and Allah will show you. He was jailed, lost his job and they put him in jail. Just was saying, don't let your imam tell you who to vote for. So the struggle is real, the difficulties are real, but we got 75-ish Young people out on the streets in downtown Jakarta, in Old City, Jakarta. We gathered them around and we sung praises unto God. And there are thousands of people all around us, Muslims, tourists, whoever. We're just praising God. And we would go in cycles. We would pray, or excuse me, we would sing, we would pray, we would preach. We'd just go in, I think we did three or four cycles. And the Muslims are mesmerized. They loved hearing it. So many people wanted to talk to us. Not only that, but most importantly, it stirred up the youth and gave them a fire that I, I, I can't even describe. Unquenchable fire. So stirred up, motivated. Now they want to openly practice their faith, whereas they were scared before. Unfortunately, they went home to their school. Now the school will take poor Indonesians from all over the islands and they'll bring them to their school and they'll educate them for free so that they can Christianize them. And that's kind of their mission. And uh, they do become Christian, but it's kind of a, they're taught to keep their faith secret. You know, they don't openly practice their faith in Indonesia because of persecution. So to get out there and do that was a big thing for them. They were very terrified to sing, even just to sing in a public forum. And they went back and they were so exhilarated. They shared the videos. They told their leaders. And their leaders got on to them and told them not to ever do that again. And that their school was going to be shut down. They brought me before a group of the leaders and explained to me the situation about how it was dangerous. And how if I were to do that in the future, their kids could go. But they would have to have no affiliation with the school whatsoever. I understand the worries and the, the problems that it might cause. But we have to be willing to be fearless. So my objective in that was to stir up the local population, to get them uh, fired up for the gospel and to labor. I guarantee you they're not ever going to forget what happened. But you have to pray and decide, what is God calling me to do? What is my objective in each and every trip? What is my role? How do I prepare? How long do I need to fast? What logistics do I need to be mindful of? I never used to be a planner. I plan all the time now because... You just have to. You have to know how to plan if you're going to lead. And to be able to lead, you have to know how to live by example. Have a prayer covering. Have people that are praying over you who are, you're accountable to, responsible to. And, uh, and once you have all that, you can, uh, you can execute. I just want to talk about a couple more things, then I'll be done. I feel like I'm way over. But Let's talk about culture. I don't know the dynamics of, of cultural differences in Canada. I can attest to what it's like in America. The fact that we are very culturally insensitive. Americans are proud. Americans are very uh, intolerant of anybody that's not like them. Okay, and it's really, it's disheartening and it's sad. All right, we have to have a love for all people. So many Americans are seriously against refugees being brought into the United States. I have a different perspective. I praise God for it. Why? Not because I'm worried that America is going to become Muslim, but because many of the Christians are too afraid to go to Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iran or Iraq or Syria or wherever. God's bringing the people to you. Go outside and let your voice be heard. Amen. What greater opportunity do you have to reach the whole world than to walk outside of your door? God has made possible something that wasn't possible a thousand years ago. We need to be able to take advantage of the time to reach the lost. But cultural considerations are very important. Let's talk about a few examples. I've learned the hard way. Don't be like me, okay? Going in, and I haven't done anything too crazy, but I've learned it's I've been in some uncomfortable situations. You go into India. Anybody know anything about eating etiquette in India? Yeah. Go ahead. Who's it? They eat with their hands. Which hand? Hands. They eat with their hand. They with their right hands. Right hand only. Because the left hand is what they use the bathroom with. Right? There's no toilet paper in India. If you want to come to India, bring your toilet paper. That's the other thing. They don't... 
there's two types of water in India. You can have sealed and unsealed. They refill water in, 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 in India, and a lot of the water bottles are tainted. If you drink the water, you're going to get sick. So how do we overcome some of these obstacles? Many people who are, uh, I guess, inexperienced would go into India and would try to navigate around that uncomfortability with, I can't drink the water. I think a more sensible approach would be to explain to them, say, hey, brother, if I drink your water, I'm going to get sick. I'm sorry, I can't. From the get-go and say, look, the bacteria in your water is different than the bacteria that we're used to in the United States and just different regions of the world have different types of bacteria, and I'm going to get sick if I drink it. So please, if you don't mind, I'm going to drink bottled water. And you say it with love, and, and they understand, trust me. I think more, in a more difficult way, uh, drinks with ice in it. You have to under, uh, try to explain that you can't have anything with ice, any cold. And I've, even, I've eaten some of this. It's very difficult to navigate some of the, the situations where you have cold food that's been prepared with tainted water. Because if it's boiled, it's OK. Um, but the water in India will get you sick. Pakistan, same way. Um, since I've become a missionary, I've had lice, I've had worms, I've had parasites, I've had everything you can imagine. And it, it, praise God, right? Uh, it's, it's a part of the job. God never said he was going to protect us from every problem. He said he's going to give us peace in the midst of them, Amen. right? And so the list goes on, but he's going to put you in those situations where it's going to test your, your faith. It's going to stretch you. If we're always comfortable, we're never going to grow. So understanding culture is extremely important. One of the biggest mistakes that I made the last time I went into India was I hugged a woman. That's a big no-no. I didn't know. The, we went into this tribal village, and we were just praying for it. We preached. We were dancing. Because uh, you, know, uh, you have to be careful because a lot of the tribal stuff has spirits behind it. But literally, they're just dancing, like tribal dancing, but to worship music. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So we're all dancing, having a good time. And all the people are watching us, and they're banging a drum and having a really good time. But it gets emotional. We start praying for people. And this one woman, she's really having a tough time, got very emotional. My instinct as an American is just to give her a hug. Woo, boy. That caused a lot of problems. She, everybody's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's like the whole world stopped. I had no idea. Um, but you have to understand what's acceptable. You know, women in India, Christian women in India, they still cover their hair, right? So. These things are important. We have to know what, it's, what is acceptable in their culture. We have to respect their culture. We have to try to even immerse ourselves into their culture. When I go to Indonesia, they wear a shirt. It's called a batik. And it, it, to me, it, it looks very different than anything I would normally wear. But when I'm in Indonesia, I wear it. And, and I have like a whole stack of shirts of batik. So when I'm in Indonesia, I'm in Malaysia, I can wear that. And uh, I think it's important to them. It's important to them to make those gestures. When I go back into India, I'm going to be wearing a, a traditional suit that they wear in Pakistan and India. Uh, I have like three or four different uh, sets. And you'll see, if you watch the videos and pictures, you'll see that. But to immerse ourselves into their culture, they love. If you go to India, they'll try to give you a fork or a spoon so you can eat to make you comfortable. If you eat with your hands, they will love it. And I'm going to tell you, I started doing it. I love it. It's fun, right? <laughs> The crazy part is you'll pray for like a hundred different people laying hands and you're like, I did not wash my hands at all and now I'm eating rice with my hands, right? <laughs> and that gets to you after a minute, but you're like, ah, Lord Jesus, thank you. <laughs> and then I get worms, but it's all right. <laughs> That's probably how it happened. But you, you understand, you're going into the village. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody. You're going into a village, they don't have running water, they don't have toilets, they don't have any sense of sanitation. It's life. And their immune system has built up to it, but we're not. So it's difficulties that we're going to face, and God gives us more grace. He gives us joy in the midst of it. It's difficult at first, I promise you, but after a while, you're like, man, this is cool. When I first started doing missions, I was that dude. I was like, <laughs> hands as high as right? And you would try to, like, hide it. You know, you'd shake a bunch of people's hands and pray for, like, two hours, and you'd go, eh. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> after a while... <laughs> After a while, you get used to it, and you're like, man, it is not going to matter. It's, it is what it is. If anything, I'm going to get dysentery. I'll get some medication. I'll be, I'll be good. It happens. But God has called us to this work. If we're not going to do it, who's going to do it? Amen.
Amen. There's a lot of beauty in different cultures around the world. When we were in Uganda, we went into this village. Brother, it would change your life. It would change your life. We went out into this, uh, this little area. We, we traveled around. We gave mattresses, big bags of food. And, you know, they have these concrete huts. And they have a fire going in their hut. I don't know how they don't die of smoke inhalation or, like, being overheated or, or whatnot, carbon monoxide or I don't know. But they're used to it. And um, even in the middle of summer, 100 and I don't know what it is in Celsius, but 110 degree Fahrenheit, just horrible, horrible heat. They have a fire going in their hut all the time. And we saw these two little boys. I, went, I never forget this. The mom was out getting water from the well, and they left three kids. The older, I think, was a daughter. She was watching the two little boys, and they're completely naked. And uh, one little boy, the older boy's face, his face was swollen on the right side. He had some kind of medical condition that caused his face to be swollen. And, and these, these little boys were just filthy, malnourished. Um, their bellies were swollen, probably because they had some kind of parasite. And, and you see the conditions. You have to be able to immerse yourself into the life that they have and to be able to show that love and compassion, right? If you go into a place and, and you're preaching down to people, they're not going to receive what you have. You have to understand that the world is bigger than Canada or America. You have to understand culture. You have to understand what's acceptable. Uh, it, it, it really is going to become far more effective if you understand the nuances of human behavior in, in different societies. What's up? I'm oh, sorry, I got this right. So don't hug. Um, I know in, in Pakistan, I prayed for, uh, we preached a service in a Christian village, and then some uh, Muslim women were listening to us, and after the service, they actually came down uh, to get prayer, and they were completely, uh, what, what do you call that, a burqa or hijab? Hijab. Hijab? Okay, so it's the burqa. Igama? Okay. So they were fully veiled, and I didn't know. I'm just like, okay, you want prayer? What do you need prayer for? And I'm trying, like, it's illegal in Pakistan. I will go to jail for the rest of my life, if not killed, for trying to convert a Muslim to Christianity in Pakistan. If you're born into Christianity in Pakistan, they have Christian villages. If you're born into Christianity, it's okay. If you're born into Muslim or Islam, it's like 97% of Pakistan, they're not able to convert. Now, Muslim men will marry Christian women and convert them into Islam, but you're not able to convert Muslims to Christianity. It's a blasphemy uh, law against it, and, and you'll be killed or in prison for the rest of your life. So I didn't care. And of course, I'm, but like our interpreters would not interpret what I was saying because you have to understand their whole village is going to get burnt down a lot of times if, if it gets out that they were trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. So it's very difficult. I did get them to translate. I don't know what they said, but I tried to get them as best I could to have them pray to, to find Jesus. But ignorantly, I just, I went up to them and I laid hands on the women. And I'm like, Father God, in the name of Jesus, heal them, whatever. And I put my hand right on their head. And I don't know if it's like this in every Muslim uh, society, but in Pakistan, it's apparently a big deal if you lay hands on a married Muslim woman <laughs> as a man. Oops. <laughs> but in the moment, man, I'm just like, let's do it. And so you see these pictures of me on social media, but everybody who's from there like, that's not a good deal. <laughs> know your culture. With that said, know what rules you can break and what rules you should break too. Uh, in Indonesia, it's rude to point at somebody. They point with their hand. So if you're going to point, you use your thumb that way, use your hand that way. Uh, if you point, it's, it's extremely rude. So you have to know the culture. Um, and if, if there's a rule that, that should be broken, you do it for the glory of God. I know a lot of places like Indonesia, other Asian cultures, the head is a holy. It's holy, so laying, like, touching somebody's head is a big deal. You're not supposed to ever touch somebody's head. But in Christian circles, if you're ministering, a lot of times it's okay. Uh, but ask first. Understand where you're at and ask, say, hey, can I lay hands on your head? Because it might not be. Try to be considerate. Understand the culture of where you're going. Immigration authorities, uh, Pakistan, India, Myanmar, Thailand, a lot of persecution, a lot of difficulty with the authorities. You have to go in. In India, they will not approve you to go in uh, as a Christian worker at all. They say 
Specifically on your visa, your e-tourist visa, it says no volunteer activities allowed. If you try to apply for a Christian worker ministry or any kind of NGO visa, they will not approve it because the Hindu populations are being Christianized at an alarming rate. It's a very Hindu government right now and they do not want any more missionaries in the country. So you have to be willing to look at an immigration authority in the eye and say, yeah, man, I'm just here to see the... I don't even know. What I got to figure out what I'm here to see before I go through this. I'm here to see uh, Mumbai, the elephants. I don't know. <laughs> Did you know in India, the cows are sacred? Yeah. But then they just wander the street and eat trash. So it's always an interesting thing to see when you're in India is that there's cows just roaming everywhere. You cannot get beef. Interestingly enough, a lot of Indian Christians love beef <laughs> and they're like oh I like man you want to eat some beef i'm like it's like this thing like this taboo thing they're not supposed to do but they're allowed to like man you want to <laughs> yeah man let's eat some beef i love beef so uh anyway i'm telling you if you guys go out and see the world you're going to realize it's beautiful we're all coming from a different place we're all uh so different but we're all the same in that we want to be loved we need jesus and he brings us together when you get home, can you be at peace knowing that you got the job done? So when you leave, if you go into an area and you, you do your job as a missionary, when you leave, can you say, I've accomplished what you've called me to do? And if you can leave and have peace with that, you can know that you can rest easy at night and that God is pleased with you. But we have to be focused. It's not about just building buildings and playing with some kids and giving them candy and all of that's wonderful. But what are we really doing to impact the kingdom of God? Amen. Last thing I want to share with you before I... Before I yes? I just, um, I should not have known the answer, the answer to that question and not have disrespect that I Was the very last part of what you said? That the war is still on. The war is still on. Yeah, you know what? And you make a good point too, because a lot of times I don't get attacked when I'm in country. It's when I get back home. That's when the, the most vicious attacks happen too. So we need to, uh, we need to stay on guard. The, the attacks are going to be ongoing. It's going to be difficult. We do our best. God gives a lot more grace than what we think. You'll see Christians that are very ruthless like, you know, if you fail God, he's going to strike you down. God is so much more patient than any of us could ever be with each other. And we don't get it right the first time. We'll, we'll get it right eventually. And he'll give us grace. He'll give us knowledge, wisdom, understanding. We have to, be, we have to study and show ourselves approved. There's one more thing that I want to cover before I quit. And I hope that you've enjoyed uh, what we've talked about today. Is I want to talk about manipulation. Um, a lot of people are, are making a lot of money on Americans, uh, Canadians, Australians, Europeans, who are going out and doing missions, it's a big business. In Pakistan and in India and all throughout the world, Africa especially, there's a lot of greed. Uh, in Uganda, where I was at, we had conversations with my friend. We had conversations at length that there's so much greed that people will start a ministry and they will come to you. I want to tell you a story. Let's say you're a 55 year, let's say you're 65 year old retired elderly woman, okay? You have a retirement, pension, whatever. You have some money in the bank. You're a Christian. You love the Lord. You're devoted. You have a heart for God. And, you know, Brother Abraham or Brother John or whatever his name is messages you on social media. And he says, oh, Sister Lisa, I want you to come to Uganda and, and have a, preach a three-day conference. I want you to speak at our three-day conference and we'll take you around the orphanages and I really feel like God is calling you to do this. And you're like, man, I've never had this opportunity before in my life. This sounds amazing. You pray and your heart is going to deceive you. And you're like, man, this sounds amazing. I want to serve God. And I'm just going to step out in faith. I'm going to go. And you go and you have the time of your life. Unforgettable experiences. You see people saved. You see uh, children get resources they've never had. 
And, and you just, you see an amazing move of God because that's, what, that's who God is. He's going to move if we walk in faith. But here's the problem that happens. This man is manipulating you to make you feel important, to make you feel exhilarated, emotionally stir you up, and make you have the time of your life so that ultimately you're going to come back, you're going to help him build the church, you're going to help him build the orphanage, you're going to help him do this and that, and you're going to empty your bank account for him. There's, this happens a lot. It is a very real issue that I've seen. They'll take people and they'll put them out in the brick kilns to work for a day and they'll film it. They'll send you the video and you'll raise $10,000 or whatever it is and they'll nickel and dime. You know, they'll, they'll say a, a bucket costs a dollar and it's really only costing 25 cents. I mean, you'll see a lot of manipulation, a lot of dishonesty, and you have to know the ins and outs of the game that people are trying to play. You have to have the wisdom and the discernment to know, okay, God wants me to work with this person because he'll stir, they'll stir you up emotionally. I've seen it happen. People have emptied their retirement and poured it into these ministries. And these people are not living for God. They have a completely different life. It's a business to them. And once you've emptied your money into their work, they're going to move to somebody else and they're not even going to remember who you are until you've got more money to give. So we have to be very mindful of who we're working with. Has God uh, called us to do this? You have to have faith and trust. See, before I go on a trip, sometimes I'll send over $10,000 before I go to a certain person I've never met before in my life. You have to have faith to do that. That's a scary thing. But if you have a confidence and knowing that this is the person God wants me to work with, he's not going to bounce on you or peace out on you. He's going to be there to be faithful, to see the job done. You have to have that, that knowing and that trust. It comes through fasting and prayer. You understand? Okay, any questions before I'm done? Any questions at all? I'm just going to give you a second. Yeah, sure. I just want to make a comment. Sure. Yeah. On the issue of um, working across culture, what you just described about India, I'm very familiar with it, from Africa where I come from. What country in Africa are you from, brother? Nigeria. Nigeria? Okay. Yeah. Because what I do basically back in Nigeria also is missions to some unrich areas in Nigeria. And even in Nigeria, we have cultural differences. So exactly what you mentioned about India, is this in the, um, how, um, between relationship between a male and a female is very, very true in, in, in Nigeria. Then lastly, on the issue of manipulation, I've witnessed it back in Nigeria where people will send information through the social media, then you get assistance from the advanced countries, but then those people, they are into real business, real business. Yeah. Even as I'm here right now, some of them, they try to reach out to me, that now that you are here, can't you reach out and then give us, like, let us have a link back home. But I've been very careful with them, since already I know their trade. Yeah. They are into it for one <coughs> Majorly, and the reason is because of the poverty that we have back in Africa, and also because there is nothing coming from the government. Everything about your life, you sweat it out yourself. You provide electricity for yourself. You provide water for yourself. There is no healthcare, and all those things. So poverty is pushing a lot of people and telling people that I'm called into the ministry. Meanwhile, they are not called. That's right. It's more like a business. I want to start a business. And back home, and it's very lucrative for very them. Lucrative yeah. Business. Back home, every street, before you know it, you find churches all over the place. A one-man ministry with people attending not more than two or three. Some it may just be their family alone that are the church members. In a whole building, you see a church, the first floor, the second floor, two churches, and all that. So what you have said, I'm affirming that it is true. Amen. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, too. You know, um... When I was in Uganda, there was actually a news article that came out that said the Ugandan government had voted to make a law to limit the amount of money that Ugandan pastors could make because they were making so much money off of the poor. 
Um, while I was there, I visited a church and I felt the power of God move in this church. I know that there are good brothers and sisters there. Um, but this brother wanted to do a crusade and he needed money from me and I felt manipulated by him, so I decided not to work with him. Sometimes God might ask you to push through and to work with him anyway. You have to be prayerful in that. But this gentleman uh, addressed his church, none of them speaking English. He addressed his congregation in English, telling his congregation how they needed to raise $2,000 to conduct a crusade. All the while I knew he's talking to me. I would so much rather him just bring me aside and say, hey, brother, we really want to have this crusade. We need $2,000. How can we make this happen? Whatever the case might be. But to direct, address me indirectly, it's a form of emotional manipulation to hold you accountable. Now everybody hears because they were translating into the tribal language. And now everybody hears. And, and now it's the, you know, the weight's on me to say, okay, is he going to come through or not? There's a lot of emotional manipulation like that. But you have to be able to navigate through those areas. Um, I've seen it, I haven't been to but one country in Africa. I'm going to Kenya and Malawi in a couple of months. Um, but I've heard stories that there's a lot of, uh, especially in Pakistan and India as well, a lot of manipulation, a lot of uh, false Christian ministries. They're not Christian, they're not living for God. They have orphanages where they're abusing them, neglecting them, and they're taking pictures of them just so that they can get money. Uh, to take their wife out to eat or whatever the case might be. So you have to be able to know where is God sending me? Who does he want me to work with? Just because it looks good, sounds good. Look, the devil can give you all sorts of stuff that look and sound good. Doesn't mean it's from God. We have to be good stewards. And we have to put his resources uh, to where we know uh, he's called us to put them. Yes, sir. Oh, that's a good question. You should have asked me that one last night, man. So I need like a few hours. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. He said, up to this point, what is the greatest hardship that I've faced as a missionary and how did the Holy Spirit give me power to overcome it? There's been a lot. I would say things are pretty good now. Early on, it was financially. And, and I could give you a whole long speech on this, brother, of how... God used that as a way to make me hate money, okay, quite literally. When I was living in the world and I was chasing the things of this world, uh, I thought that money could answer a lot of the issues that I had, but that's really what was one of the factors that caused me to come to that state of brokenness and emptiness, knowing that it didn't give me any source of satisfaction or sense of uh, peace. So when I, God began to mold me, he broke the pride. I remember when I first came back, I was like, I'm not knocking on doors. I'm above that. God's called me to this. He broke all of that, man. You know, and, and I, I'm ashamed to say that, but like early on when I first came back to God, I had a lot of that worldly pride. And I said, I'm above all that. And like, I will do anything now, but he has to break that. It's a systematic process. So that love of money I didn't even think that I loved it, when I, when I, but early on in that process, he not just took the love away, he made me despise money, made me look at it like, I hate you, but I have to have you to do the things that God has called me to do, talking about money. So that when God gives you the money that you need, you're not going to have that love for it and feel like you need to blow it, doing this and that and spending it on frivolous things or, you know, building a new church every few years unnecessarily. We see so much wasteful spending, sending whole youth groups to countries where they're not going to do anything. I see it all the time, and I'm not trying to be critical. I don't want to have a critical spirit today, but giving, I would say the greatest hardship early on was not having enough finances and having to pray day in and day out like, God, I need a hundred dollars to pay these bills and have food and have toothpaste or whatever. Um, going from a six-figure job to having barely anything and not only trying to live but conducting mi ministry work at the same time, having money for travel. So what I did is we actually, I traveled throughout the United States and I walked in faith and we only had, this is a whole long testimony I can't tell you, but we, just for the first couple of days, I paid for the hotel and I said, I know that by the end of my stay, more money is going to come in for me to extend the trip. And God took care of the whole trip. Uh, I was able to speak at a church where they gave me a, a, a love offering and 
I was able to take care of everything for the whole month. And then the next month, I did it again. And for the first six months or so, I was going around throughout the United States. And then an opportunity opened. God doesn't always bring you money. Sometimes he takes away your need for it. So for the first year I traveled internationally, I was able to fly at a very reduced cost on United Airlines because I have a friend who works at United. She put me on her, uh, on her, she, yeah, whatever it's called. What, she put it on the, the employee program. So I was able to fly standby anywhere in the U.S. And then I was able to fly uh, for like 40, 50% off internationally. And then I would find contacts in different countries and I would just stay with them. I remember the first time I went to Israel, I was there for nine, 11 days, 11 days. And the plane ticket cost me $450 and he paid for my food, lodging. I, I spent like $500 the whole trip, 11 days in Israel. Only God can do that, man. Only God. So I hate to say finances, man, but when you're doing ministry, a lot of times you're going to run into those struggles. Uh, I would say I've never been a lonely type of person. I've never felt lonely, but the aloneness gets to you sometimes, that Jeremiah feeling or, you know, that, that sense of like Paul where he just doesn't. You have people all around you, but people don't always understand the burdens that you carry. You understand? The, the weight of the suffering that you see. How do you go month in and month out traveling to different places? You see children hurting and suffering and broken and you know you can't do enough and you know you might not ever see them again, but you don't want them to suffer and there's only so much you can do. How do you live with that? And the more you know, the more this, it's just if God didn't carry it for me, I couldn't bear it. Right. But you still feel the hurt and the pain. So uh, God has shielded me from a lot so far, but it, there's been some struggles for sure. Does that answer your question good enough? I might be able to come up with something better if I have more time, but it's been pretty good so far. Anybody else? What would you suggest for women that want to go on missionary? Women that want to go on missionary trips. Um, I have a rule for, for this ministry that we only, uh, if a woman wants to go on a, a missionary trip, there has to be at least one other woman, right? They need to be in twos, they need to be a company. Um, Women typically have a lot more considerations on their trips, hygiene-wise, and um, clothing is incredibly important to consider. I, I see a lot of Christian women that are not dressed modestly enough. Uh, like you go in, and I, I'm going to be the person to say it, you go into a developing country, spaghetti strap shirt is not okay, right? It's just not. Especially a lot of them are going to expect you to cover your head. Uh, you go to India, you got to take your shoes off. We can talk about a lot of cultural things. But, uh, sister, I, I don't know. I haven't taken a lot of females on my trips just because I know it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, but I have had uh, one sister that went on a few trips with us, and she did a great job. I think a role to be able to pray for the, the women is, is a lot more important. Uh, and you're able to minister to them in a way that we as men can't. So it's an incredibly important thing. Uh, but there's a lot more planning and considerations that go into it. I know I'm not answering your question that well, but uh, I just haven't had a lot of women come on mission trips with us. Are there a lot more safety issues, like say, for example, than for men? Not really. Uh, I mean, as far as like human trafficking, not really. Rape, you're just not going to see it too much um, because we are always in a group. You're not really ever alone. Um, our hosts are usually very considerate and make sure, especially if a woman's there, that they're always taken care of, very safe. So safety is not really ever an issue on the, the trips that I've been on. So when you get back home, what's your uh, daily routine like? What's your Don't ask me that. Like, Don't ask me that. No, but as a, as, as rest. Rest and, and, and just how does that look like, you know, coming back home and, and uh, you know, maybe I guess some disciplines are prayer and, and reading the word and... So describe, for the new believers, I want you to describe, like, what's a good, strong discipline to have um, walking with God? Well, I mean, we, we all know prayer and reading our Bible is, is incredibly important. The Bible talks about waking up early, um, but I know for myself, I'm not an early riser. It's very difficult for me to, to get up early. So I do a lot of my praying and, and reading at night before I go to bed, and I think that's good, too. Anytime that you can get alone with God and be with Him, 
that's where, that's where he wants you. I remember early on in ministry, I was praying to God on my face and I said, God, I'm so excited to be back out on the streets serving you. And God spoke to me. It's amazing. He said, Philip, I want you to be out on the streets and excited to get back on your knees and be with me. It's not out on the street that, he, that he's impressed by you. He wants you spending time with him. If we're not spending time with him, then all of this, these works are, are filthy rags. It's nothing. God can use anybody. He can use anybody. Here's the cool thing. When you pray, you're praying God's word, or the Holy Spirit in you is praying his word back to himself. When you go out and you preach the gospel, the spirit of God is preaching through you his word, and it's returning to him for his glory. When a lost person is drawn from darkness into light. It's His Spirit that's moving. When you go out and you preach, you're preaching in His power. Everything comes from God. Your desire for repentance comes from God. Your ability to obey Him comes from God. Everything. So we have to understand, nothing is us. Nothing is in our own strength. And if we're doing it in our own strength, then we're not, we're not doing it the right way. Um, I, I get off on tangents, sorry. So, but just routine, man. Uh, I, I rest a lot. I rest. I pray, worship, uh, read my Bible, but I have to catch up on a lot of accounting stuff, record keeping, get with my accountant, do a lot of fun stuff that I hate, uh, receipts and all that, you know, but um, you have to be filled up for the next trip and spending time with my family. Incredibly important uh, that you spend time with your family. And that's really, I think, number one focus when I come home is that it's my family. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I have a question from my friend. I'm translating for him. Um, Say, can you speak louder? A question from my friend. Um, I'm translating for him. Yeah. And his question was, in order to be a global missionary, do you have to uh, know English very well? Like, is it it's very important to, to study English to make to to, uh, to be effective in global mission? I think you could get different answers depending on the person, but I don't think so. I mean, around the world, English is the most prevalent language. It's going to be a difficult time for you uh, to be extremely effective without having the English language. But I am of the belief and faith that even if you go and lay hands on people and you pray in your own language, God's going to move, you know. And uh, I, I believe in the power of God. So I believe that you could definitely be effective speaking a different language as well. Anybody else? Sister. Yes, I have a question. Once traveling in the world, those countries, that's all and you teach them about God the Father and God Jesus Christ, um, how, do you, how do you talk to them with not losing the faith once you're not there to continue? Um, teaching them not to give up no matter what happens? You... It's difficult. I will say, sister, that not only is it difficult when you, you know, you go into a village, they've never heard the gospel before. They're very accepting. A, a huge crowd of them want to follow Jesus. But then you leave and you're like, well, how many of them really became born again? And you have to let God sort out all of that. And you want them to be able to persevere. But in a lot of places, it's difficult just to get the pastors to follow up. I can't. I have to rely on them. So to have the pastors to follow, and they'll go back into the village. They'll go and they'll preach again. But I'm talking about following up one-on-one, -on -one, making sure the people who prayed have a Bible in their hand. There's a lot of pastors that are uh, very against just handing out Bibles freely because there's a business where people will take free stuff from you and just sell it on the street. So... I'm of the belief, I don't care as long as there's a Bible, you know, whether it's a, on the street or I, the more Bibles that flood the earth, the better. But if you're a poor pastor, you don't think of it like that. You just have your boxes and you're clinging to them tightly. I have a pastor friend in Myanmar, the, the pastor of Torch of Christ Church there in Myanmar. He has a huge stack of Bibles on his bookshelf. I had to rebuke him. I said, brother, these Bibles literally have dust on them. And you have believers in your church that don't have Bibles. How? And they're like, well, when they come here every service, we share the, the community. I was like, no, they have to read on their own at home. They have to. There is no sense in you having a stack of Bibles with dust on them, and you have Christians in your congregation going home without a Bible to read. But they're waiting on this like super special occasion, because if they give them all out, they're not going to have any to give out. 
But it's like, where's your faith that God's going to provide more? Amen. So it, it's, it's a challenge to break that cultural mindset that they have as a pastor who's in poverty in their region uh, just to give out New Testaments I've seen as such a difficult thing. Good news is we have a brother that uh, was able to donate 100 money for 100 Bibles. We go to one of my locations in India in a few weeks. We're going to have 100 Bibles to give out. So that's a really good thing. Um, but I had to struggle with a pastor there before who was not wanting to give out Bibles. And I'm like, dude, you have 30 people that just prayed for Jesus. How are they going to know him unless they have a Bible? I don't care if they can't read. If they can just hold it at night when they sleep. Amen. Right? Yeah. And I've seen a lot of people in places like India, they will grip, they don't even know what it says, and they're gripping it like it's the most important thing they've ever owned. Yeah. And it's beautiful. And I'm talking about, we just drive down the road, see a straw hut village on the side of the road. We stop, preach the gospel, hand out New Testaments, and there's old women breaking down to tears. It's incredible. But they need Bibles. They have to have Bibles, and they have to have follow-up. So it's a very difficult thing. It's tough sledding. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to go home in faith, knowing that God's going to take care of the rest. Right? We can, there's only so much we can do, and then at the end of the day, we trust God. Any other questions? Yes? This is going to sound kind of weird, but how does God direct you to go? Oh, it's so different every time. That's a good question. Is, is that... Like, is it kind of like... I mean, no, actually, it's not that. Never mind. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to hear what... Go ahead. No, I was... This is a very fleshy part of it. I was like... Occasionally. Let me tell you a story, though. Every time I go to Israel, I don't even put out a note. Like sometimes I go to India, I'm like, I need brothers to come with me to India. Every time I go to Israel, I have people that message me and say, Brother Philip, I just feel God is calling me to missionary work, and I'm, I'm so excited to evangelize. I really think that God's pressing me to go to Israel with you. I'm like, I think you just want to go to Israel, <laughs> right? I see it so much. We deceive ourselves. Our heart is deceitful. And um, I see it a lot. There, there are places I want to go. I've always, my whole life, wanted to go to Iceland. I still haven't been there. Uh, I wanted to go to the Nordic countries, though. I was able to go there, Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Uh, in the last three years, it's somewhere around 30 countries we've been to, whether it's street evangelism or missionary work. And uh, like Latvia, Lithuania, I wanted to go to. I was able to go. There's been places where I didn't want to go. London, I hate no offense. Like, I just don't like London. The people are great. I love the people. But the animosity towards the gospel, it's just like, I don't want to deal with all that. I would just so much rather go to India where they just love to hear the gospel and everybody raises their hands to get saved. And I just really don't want to deal with the animosity towards the gospel. So a few months ago when he sent me back to London, I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> We're not always happy with what God calls us to do at first. But we got to break that flesh. we got to let him break the flesh. and say, okay, Lord. And we sort of enjoy it. And it ended up being an amazing trip. And I really enjoyed it. And now I have a lot more love for London. But uh, sometimes he calls us to the difficult places. My heart is I love going to the, what you would traditionally call the more difficult, like, uh, I don't know, Pakistan or Indonesia or somewhere like that. Um, that's my heart. You know, I feel... Like when I'm walking down an old dusty road in Indonesia and in Jakarta, there's like no sidewalks and we're just walking down the dirt road. Like, man, there's nowhere else in the world I would rather be than right here. There's a peace in that. So it's different every time. Sometimes I have a schedule around October, November. I'll kind of come up with a schedule for the next year and it always changes. I had no plan to go to Central America and I just didn't have peace with where I was going and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and he showed me, hey, when I went to India the first time, I had no plan to go to India. I was actually planning, I think, to go to Africa or somewhere. And he changed it last minute because I was praying and I just felt a lack of peace. It's like the prompting of the Holy Spirit where he's saying, wait, don't move anymore. And he'll change us. Yes. Yeah, I just got one question. What about like the countries where the Bible is banned and going to, uh, going to church you know, is super legal? I haven't been to any of those places yet. Uh, I'm willing. Um, what countries are you thinking? Like North Korea, China? 
I actually, I want to go into China. I have friends that live in China. Uh, they uh, live in Shenzhen, I think it's called. Uh, it's north of Hong Kong, and, and there's some things I want to do. I don't want to say it too much because we're filming, but I, I want to go into China, and I want to do some things, but there's camera, there's like, I don't know how many. They say they're everywhere. Like My Chinese friends, there's cameras everywhere, and they study your behavior, and you get points of how good of a citizen you are, and they're, they're studying, the human behavior study is crazy. I could tell you all kinds of stuff, but, uh, you know, it's that beast system that's being set up, and... Uh, it's unfortunate, but I do want to go into there, and I think eventually I'm going to. Uh, I have a friend who had a dream. She said that she's had dreams that we go into North Korea one day. I don't know. Um, I'm willing, but I would be scared. Like, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Um, it's hard, man. It, it's hard, but you go in faith and you trust that God's good. And if you die, praise God. You know, but you have to be able to get to that faith. It's one thing to just say it and another thing to mean it. And if we're saying we're ready to die for Jesus, but we're too afraid to live for him, then come on. You know, we're deceiving ourselves. Any other questions? They're like, pizza, 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 pizza. I'm only here once. Y'all good? All right, you can, yeah, if you think of anything, you can ask me later. I'll be here all day. I'll be here the next few days, so let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we lift you up and we glorify you. We thank you for today. I thank you for Pastor David inviting me. I thank you for everyone who's here who has heard uh, what I had to say today, God. I thank you for your grace upon my life to enable me to, uh, to demonstrate an example so that it might edify others. God, I thank you that you're going to do something incredible through the lives of your people. And I pray that you would raise up this army to go out into the highways and the byways, the city streets and the alleyways to shine their light, to preach with the fire of God, to break down strongholds, to break the chains of those who are in bondage, to set them free so that they might walk in the glory of God and in faith knowing that we are not a lost generation that we can go out and claim that we can bring back this generation to the kingdom of God, that our youth would no longer be brought into destruction, that we might bring them from the edge of that, that precipice, the edge of that cliff, and, and to save this generation so we might see a revival, a harvest in this end time. God, let it start with us. Let us be the examples that we need to be. Lord God, I pray that you would just uh, remove everything from our lives that takes away from your glory. And that when the world sees us, they see our behavior, they see our words, they see our lives, they would know that you live in us, that you dwell in us, that you abide in the tabernacle of our heart, and that you're going to do something, uh, that, that, that you're just doing something beautiful. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Help them to learn what's in these booklets and to pass their test, to be certified, or whatever you've called them to do. And Lord, I pray for opportunity. I pray for resources. I pray for uh, just uh, them to go through that season of planning and preparation, and for you to just mold them and make them into what you would have for them to be. God, I pray that you would just bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. We thank you for the gift of pizza. We love you so much, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Please be with us today as we go out and preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Come on, give him another big hand. Philip Blair. One of the most powerful global missionaries on the planet today. What an honor to have you here. Thank you.